Okay. Welcome everyone. Um, everybody that's here in person and we are also live streaming. So welcome to everybody who is watching from the comfort of their homes. Thank you for joining us um, today for this event titled Biodiversity Loss in PEI, Finding Solutions Together. My name is Bianca McGregor. I'm the executive director uh, for Island Nature Trust, Prince Edward Island's largest and oldest land trust. And I have to say I'm really, really proud of our staff uh, today, not just for their continued hard work in the field, but uh, for their thoughtful and unique approaches to collaboration and broader education. Today's event builds on the momentum from COP15 and discussions around the critical state of biodiversity diversity, provincially, nationally, and internationally. We're thrilled to have so many of our colleagues in the room with us today, uh, here from the conservation community, to discuss not just the challenges we face when it comes to biodiversity loss, but also the important work that's being done in the province to halt and reverse it. We're honored that Todd McLean musician and creator of the book Global Chorus, has agreed to moderate this evening's discussions. And we we're just having a little chat about how this group can get pretty passionate sometimes, so it's going to be a fun night. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land which we are presenting on tonight is unceded Mi'kmaq territory, and we pay our respects to the Indigenous Mi'kmaq people of this territory, past, present, and future. As an extension of this acknowledgement, I would like to invite Julie Pelashelash, elder and former poet laureate, to provide a welcome. Gwei, Jalasi, and Deloisi Julie. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Julie. I am Mi'kmaq, and I reside in this beautiful, unceded territory known as Mi'kma'ki. And I'd like to welcome all of you with peace and friendship. Jigawe Niskem, or come to me, Creator. I thank the Creator, the one who has created everything who has given us our four sacred gifts that we carry with us each and every day, the fire, the water, the earth, and the wind. We are also given seven sacred teachings that the grandfathers carry, and the grandmothers are there too. They're walking beside them. Love, truth, respect, wisdom, humility, honesty, and bravery. We carry these teachings with us every second of the day. We thank our ancestors, which we honor them, the past that they have given us. And because they could not finish their path, they gave it to us. And we are supposed to walk with it now as they stand beside us here in the present and walk with us as we hear their life's teachings and responsibilities. But we, in turn, have to give it to our youth, our younger ones coming up. We thank our grandmothers and our grandfathers for being there and sitting with us everywhere we are to guide us and protect us and be there to support. Thank you all for being here today to support this night. Adesu, Midewajic, Migadadesit, Compte Infant Important, Every Child Matters. Sky so high, 
Spread your wings and fly so high Way high Thank you so much for that. Oh, just beautiful. Um, my name is Todd McLean, and uh, I am the moderator for this evening. And it is such a pleasure and honor to be asked to do this. And um, as Bianca said, this could be quite a passionate evening. We'll see. You know, it might get a little rowdy. And if so, I got to be here to break things up. Um, we. <laughs> We will call upon you to, um, to have some questions uh, later on in the evening, but um, we are, the way this evening is going to work is uh, there's going to be four speakers uh, in each half, and we are going to have a little intermission, and we'll be able to enjoy some treats at the back um, during the intermission, and uh, there's also a couple of things uh, to tell you about uh, that are going on out in the lobby that uh, you can experience at intermission. Um, I just have to say, uh, first off, though, a, a big, could we give a big round of applause to the Island Nature Trust for the amazing hard work they've done to put this evening together. Oh, just fantastic. Um, as it was mentioned, uh, the, COP, the COP15 Biodiversity Conference was held in Montreal in December, um, where there were the 30 by 30 targets uh, that were set in place. I think probably most of you in the room have heard about that, the 30 by 30 targets. It's not as what one might think maybe a math problem to figure out the amount of uh, UFOs that will be destroyed in, in the higher altitude this year. It's not that. It's actually, um, it's the, it calls upon the world's governments to designate 30% of the Earth's land and ocean as protected areas by 2030. And so that was just uh, one of, of the four goals and 23 targets set in place uh, during that successful, I think we can call it, it was a success uh, for COP15. It, it took you know quite a while for things to be sorted out, but they were sorted out and really great uh, success that they arrived to. And so tonight, Island Nature Trust is, has created this event basically uh, reverberating off of that same kind of energy uh, and drive from that conference surrounding biodiversity laws and the solutions that we can explore to help solve it. And you know what? We often forget, uh, for whatever reasons, here in our modern lifestyles, how important a healthy ecosystem is. But it's not all doom and gloom. And there are many, many ways that we as individuals uh, and as a province that we can make a difference. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So really looking forward to hearing uh, the speakers that are going to be getting up for you here in a moment. And um, I just had to, to go over a few housekeeping items first. One is uh, the bathroom locations, if, if you haven't seen them. It's just, um, just by the doors out there, just on your right when you come in the doors. It's just over there to the left. I went and experienced it earlier. It was quite a wonderful experience. So, and actually, yeah, like the soap really foams up well when you, I don't need to elaborate, but, um, and this, this event is uh, being live streamed. People are listening to me talk about bathrooms all over the world right now. Um, I don't know how many people have, have logged on, but hopefully it's in the dozens, maybe even the hundreds. Is it, we don't, okay, in the dozens. Yeah! Hopefully it just keeps going up through the night. Um, and so this recording of, of the night will be made available on YouTube, by the way, if you want to just experience it again or show you know, friends and family. These are some of the highlights. You can check it out on YouTube. 
And so, yes, a special hello to those who are joining us virtually tonight. And um, uh, one other thing, of course, I do need to ask you to, to turn off your cell phones if you haven't already done that. Uh, so a brief overview uh, of the agenda, uh, Island Nature Trust, we're, we're going to get up a couple members of INT in just a moment, once again, just to briefly explain a little bit about what the trust does and also about uh, a call to action and available resources. Um, as some of you have probably seen, there is a call to action tree out there, and they're going to talk to you a little bit more about that. It's just such a, a beautiful uh, piece of art and a beautiful idea. And so we'll hear more about that. And um, then, uh, we, so the break will be 15 minutes long. And um, yeah, that's your chance to, for all of you to share your, your commitment on that call to action tree. And uh, then we'll have the second set of speakers after the break. And then we're gonna finish off with, it was supposed to be sort of a little surprise that I was going to do at the end. But I guess obviously all of you can see there's musical instruments here. That's what's going to happen. Some music at the end. So with that, I'm going to uh, invite Island Nature Trust up just to say a few words about INT. Thank you so much for coming this evening. My name is Janelle Smith. I'm the Business Services Manager at Island Nature Trust, and this is Joanna Murth, Island Nature Trust Education and Outreach Coordinator. Before we get started with our wonderful panelists, who I'm sure you all came to see, we just wanted to give you a little bit of background about why we are here tonight, why we decided to create this event, and also just a little bit about how we feel individuals can impact biodiversity loss. So since you're here tonight, I'm sure you're aware of the situation with biodiversity loss around the world. You may have heard the term sixth mass extinction and how approximately a million species are at risk of extinction. And it's not just extinction risk, but there's a lot of populations of wildlife that are declining significantly. The World Wildlife Fund recently in 2022 um, created a report that showed monitored wildlife populations have declined by 69%. And it's even more stark for freshwater species, which have declined by 83% in, in monitored species. Unfortunately, a lot of this decline leads back to, to human action. So whether that's climate change, overexploitation, pollution, invasive species, or land use change that is leading to habitat loss, it, it does unfortunately lead back to us. <laughs> And it's not just a global problem, it is an issue in PEI as well. Over the last few hundred years, PEI has gone from almost entirely forested, about 98%, to around 30% forest cover in the early 1900s. It has gone up a little bit again since then, but a lot of the remaining forest has been impacted by humans. So whether that's its young regenerating forest that were once cleared, or maybe it's a human managed forest, so it's only one or a few species and lacks that diversity of the traditional Acadian forest. So humans also led to that change. PEI is the most densely populated province in Canada and the significant development has impacted how we use the land, as well as our forestry practices and the intensification of agriculture to feed our, our growing population. So I'm just gonna give you a little background about Island Nature Trust. Island Nature Trust was created by a passionate group of individuals in 1979 to address in part some of those issues I just discussed. Our team works to conserve natural ecosystems across the island and we kind of have three key areas that we work in. So we acquire land through donation and purchases to protect it. We protect it through legislation, PEI, Natural Areas Protection Act, which protects it in perpetuity. And that way it's protected in perpetuity for wildlife and also for, for human enjoyment in, in, on some of our sites. Once we own the land, our work doesn't end there. We have a stewardship team who works to make sure that the natural areas are healthy and robust for the wildlife using the natural areas and living there. Some of the activities that our stewardship team does include managing for invasive species, planting missing native species, or adding native species, 
And also managing for human impacts. For example, cleaning up old dump sites is one example. We also have a species at risk team that works to conserve habitat, monitor and assess reproduction of species at risk in PEI. Currently our programs at Island Nature Trust um, surround piping plover, bobo link, barn swallow and bank swallow. So I've been questioning for many years, who is responsible for halting and reversing biodiversity loss? Is it, is it the government? Is it charities such as Island Nature Trust? Is it businesses? And it would be easy to push the responsibility on to different organizations and institutions. But at the end of the day, I keep coming back to it's individuals that manage and invest in businesses. It's individuals that elect and lead governments and it's individuals that also work with charities or work in charities. And it's also individuals that work within communities, talk to neighbors, talk to friends. So I keep coming back to it's the individual that's responsible for sparking that, that action. And I think together, collective individual action can really make a change. And that's part of the reason that we're here tonight. Um, in addition to learn from our wonderful group of presenters and panelists, we are asking each and every one of you to commit to one action that you will take to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. You may have seen the tree that Todd referred to and Joanna created <laughs> all by herself um, that's hanging out there. And so we're asking each and every one of you to commit to, to one action and this tree will kind of illustrate our action that's committed together. And Joanna's gonna describe that a little more. Thanks, Janelle. Good evening. Um, some of you will notice on your seats when you came in, the leaves, I see them hanging on people. I love it. Um, so the tree out in the lobby is the tree of action. And as we listen to the presenters tonight and reflect on our own ways that we can implement one small tangible action into our own day-to-day -day lives, please write this down on your leaf. And at the intermission, you can go and hang it up in the lobby. Um, so some different ideas for calls to action. Um, on the back side of your agenda, you will maybe have noticed a list. Um, these are just some brief ideas that we've put together. It's by no means an exhaustive list, um, but there is room for you to fill out some other ideas as the night progresses. And um, so some of the um, actions that you can take at home um, are to plant and focus on native species and um, creating diversity on your own properties. Um, from a community standpoint, uh, we are focusing on volunteering. There's a lot of really amazing organizations. I, as the engagement coordinator, am obviously talking up my own department, um, but there, there are a lot of organizations in PEI who are doing really important work and I'm sure would very much appreciate your time and energy. Um, I know that our organization benefits a lot from the work that our volunteers share with us. So that's always greatly appreciated. And um, also from a community standpoint is talking to your local MLAs. If you have any issues with, um, you know, things that you would like to see different in terms of conservation, contact your local MLA, get involved. And finally, um, we have some other different um, categories in the lobby, the Invasive Species Council is here tonight and they have a wonderful booth. Stop by, learn about what invasives are on PEI and how you can help mitigate bringing in new ones. Thanks very much. Oh yeah. We, we can't wait to see what you come up with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle and, and Joanna. All right, so we're about to uh, get started with our first panel of four presenters. And I wanted to say that uh, after all four panelists present, we're gonna have uh, 20 minutes where we can open it up to uh, some questions and discussion. And of course, you can come up to that microphone in the center when you have, uh, if you have a question for one of them. 
Um, and I also wanted to mention uh, as well, I, I forgot to mention off the top, um, one of the... Uh, one of the activities out in the lobby is uh, a PEI. The PEI Invasive Species Council has a game uh, to win. You can win a book and you just need to identify some seeds. And if you identify correctly, um, you win this incredible book. And Cassidy is going to come up at the end and maybe talk a little bit more about that. But um, yeah, you can go see them at the intermission and, and play that game and hopefully you win. All right, so we're going to get uh, into the first panel of speakers, um, and maybe I guess you all just uh, come on up on, and have a seat here. Um, yes, thank you, Rosemary. Well, our first our first speaker is actually Rosemary Curley uh, from Nature PEI. So um, the the second one is Lana Campbell, Nature Conservancy of Canada. And Jana Chevary from Ducks Unlimited Canada. And then we're going to hear from Gary Schneider from McPhail Woods. So uh, first speaker is uh, Rosemary Curley from the night. If you wanted to come on up, Rosemary. Excellent. Okay. Okay, I'll just nod to you then and say next. Okay, thank you very much. Um, historical loss of biodiversity on Prince Edward Island. Historical because it, it uh, took part place quite a while ago, but also historic because of the magnitude of the loss and the significance of the species that disappeared. Okay, <laughs> um, I can't. I can't see this on the screen now. Uh, well, it won't advance. I think is what. Oh, okay, it does advance. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, so it, I'm going to uh, start here with the with the beaver. They they uh, were probably the first thing that disappeared from Prince Edward Island. Extirpated before 1700 reintroduced in the 1900s. They, if you look at the little map on the bottom uh, right of your screen, you'll see the historic range of the beaver. And uh, you can see it got to every nook and cranny of North America, short of uh, the southwestern deserts of the US, the Arctic tundra, and a good bit of Mexico that is rather warm. They were... Uh, well, I just think it's it's hard to imagine that these beaver uh, wouldn't have gotten to PEI when they, the island was connected to the mainland for 4,000 years following uh, the retreat of the glaciers. And they were, there were beavers in Cape Breton at that time, 9,500 BC, uh, BP, which is, BP is 1950. So archeologists thought that up. Okay, and there were teeth, of course, that show that the beavers were here. Um, I have to go fairly fast because I have a lot of species, unfortunately, and I don't have much time. So next, I tried to put these in chronological order, and next are the caribou, reported by Nicholas Denny's in 1672, and uh, he didn't think they would last very long. A century later, Samuel Holland still saw them, although he said some, though very few. And that's really the last record of those caribou, except for uh, some caribou antlers in the woods. And uh, these, they likely disappeared through over-exploitation because they were good meat, and uh, they were the only uh, large game animal on the island. So if you have caribou or moose or deer, uh, then you'll have wolves because they, they prey on large game. In 1721, uh, a wolf pelt was shipped, uh, was presented to at Port Le Joie to be shipped to France. And uh, the guy who uh, wrote about it, uh, Denis de la Ronde, he said, island wolves are of a prodigious size. Actually, he said it with a French accent. 
Um, but did anyone else uh, mention them? No, not until 1846. And then a wolf was trapped in Tryon. So it looks like there's one or two records of the wolves in PEI. And uh, no doubt they were here, um, going back even further when we had more uh, big game uh, to support them. Now, this is the only um, species that I'm going to talk about that lived in the water. And this is the walrus. Its, uh, its early name was the sea cow, or that's how people knew it. And sea cow head and sea cow pond are named after this walrus. The, um, the walrus, had, there was huge herds of the walrus on Sable Island. They're replaced now by gray seals there which are also huge and, uh, and quite a phenomenon. Um, the, uh, they were also around the Magdalene's, and the Acadians participated in the Magdalene's hunt. Uh, for instance, I think it was Pierre Arsenault and some of his uh, family members that built a boat and went to the Magdalene's to participate in the walrus hunt. Hunting on PEI of the walrus was described by John Stewart, and what they did is they got between the walruses because they would come ashore and sort of lie around in the sun when they weren't eating. And uh, the uh, people got between the walruses and the shore. They had sticks and poked them and drove them into the woods. Now, I don't know if I would poke a one or two ton walrus, but of course that's what they said they did. And they, they uh, boiled them down for their oil and chipped their ivory and so on. And so they were eliminated in the early 1800s. The great auk, um, this is kind of a, a different one for me. I, I sort of thought maybe the auks were here. Uh, I talked to David Cairns. They were extinct in 1844, and this is a date from Iceland. Uh, we don't actually know when the auks disappeared. But uh, they ranged around the North Atlantic, like through uh, the, the British Isles, uh, Iceland, um, Newfoundland, Funk Island, and uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence at the uh, lesser uh, bird rocks. Now, there was originally, I think, four of these rocks, but they're pictured below there. And uh, they were flightless birds. The Magdalene's aren't that far from PEI. In... Uh, in 1534, Jacques Cartier visited the uh, bird rocks and they took, he said in his journal, a thousand plus murs and great ox. And he said, we could have gone back with more long boats and filled up more. The, uh, the birds were flightless swimmers and uh, the young, when they left the nest, they would have been swimming around, basically feeding until till they became independent uh, with, under, and they would have had their parents with them. And so it's quite likely that they swam through our waters here on PEI. And uh, <clears throat> we don't really know exactly when they disappeared from this region. Um, Audubon was in Labrador in 1833, but he, he wasn't near any of these sites and didn't mention them. Okay. After 1840, there was a great human population increase on PEI with uh, European settlers and also great loss of the forest because uh, these uh, people wanted to uh, farm. And, uh, you know, PEI was originally supposed to be the breadbasket of Fort Lewisburg. Anyway, um, most of our um, wildlife lives in the forest. And the American Martin was one that suffered greatly from the loss of the forest. It disappeared due to that and also unregulated trapping because it was very eager to trap. And people did trap fur, you know, for fur on PEI to make money. And uh, <laughs> by 1879, the government was getting a little worried about the Martins and also the otters about whether they would survive. So they closed the uh, season sort of like the kit rearing season from May to November, so you couldn't take them. And uh, really there weren't much in the way of closed seasons back then. The, uh, there were seasons uh, to protect rough, rough grouse in the 1860s and also waterfowl, but this is one of the first uh, uh, regulations passed to protect wildlife. In 1906, 
they uh, you know closed it for another month, but that was too little too late, and I only have two minutes left. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> okay, River Otter extirpated by 1898. It was a fur bearer of renown. Uh, we already mentioned the close seasons. Uh, Robert Jenkins saw the otter sign in 1898, and then two pelts from Piscid in a store in Charlottetown. Now, there are some 20th century records from 1951 and 1970 of single eels, um, die, or, um, otters dying. <laughs> and uh, I think that may have indicated that they swam over here. So good news for PEI, river otters are breeding here now because they can swim long distances in marine waters. Settlement and deforestation um, caused loss of a lot of things, but what we don't know about is how many plants and other life forms were lost. The main settlement era was in the 1800s, and um, the population built up actually uh, 88,000 in 1880, 100,000 or uh, 30,000 more that decade. So just to picture this, there were was 70% clear in 1900, no environmental rules. And, you know, if you want 30 by 30, you're going to have to still have a lot of people uh, protecting in addition to that if we want to keep our wildlife. Passenger pigeon, extinct, market hunted to zero. It was here in PEI. It, there was three to five billion um, passenger pigeons, according to uh, um, some article <laughs> by Jeff Hogan. But um, the um, Jacques Cartier was here in 1534 and also uh, remarked on the passenger pigeons that there was an infinite number of wood pigeons, as he called them, because he knew that bird in France. So hard to imagine that, you know, three to five billion birds and they all disappeared from market hunting. The black bear, common, greatly feared. Um, there was a bounty put on it because they liked to eat the, uh, um, the livestock that people left, left to roam in the woods. The last specimen was shot at Surrey Line Road, 1927. I think I must have missed the links there somewhere. I'm not sure where it went, but it was also bountied. <laughs> And, uh, and gone before 1900. Then last is the Eskimo curlew, endangered, but uh, it's, it's listed as endangered because you have to have no records for 50 years before you can call it extinct. So the next time our government looks at it, I'm sure it will be extinct. And uh, you know, all the shorebirds were market hunted and uh, in, on PEI they were, um, put in barrels and shipped to Boston. The, the Eskimo curlew has a very small range in the northwest of Canada, so that probably made it more vulnerable than some of the others. Thank you, thank you very much. Great, Rosemary, I know you were kind of rushed to work things in there at the end, but that was fantastic. Um, really fascinating to hear about, uh, and saddening to hear about the, the, the species that have been lost from the island. Um, but yeah, as far as the time frame goes, maybe it should be like the Oscars, like all hop on the piano and the music will get louder and louder as you need to finish up. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> um, we'll get our next uh, presenter up, Lana Campbell uh, from the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Good evening. I mean, you can't help it. You've asked a couple people who are really passionate to squeeze it into 10 minutes. Okay. Um, good evening. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the room tonight. My name is Lana Campbell. Um, I'm the program director for the Nature Conservancy Canada on Prince Edward Island. The Nature Conservancy Canada is a nationwide uh, charitable conservation organization, and we've been working hard to deliver large-scale uh, permanent land conservation for six decades. Okay, so I wanted to begin this evening by taking a moment to take in this, soak in this warm, welcoming scene, maybe a nice one on a cold, dark uh, February evening. I don't even know if it's that cold outside, but um, this is my family um, on the way to Greenwich Beach. 
And I don't think it's lost on this crowd the importance of nature in our daily lives. Nature sustains us. Its basic services make life possible for people. Plants clean air, filter water, bacteria decompose waste, tree roots hold soil in place to prevent erosion. So biodiversity is important to humans, human health, and well-being. And when nature is, is in trouble, it is a shared responsibility. So the planet, sort of as we heard in the preamble, I was worried everyone was taking my notes, um, is experiencing a dangerous decline in nature as a result of human activity. And so it's experiencing the largest loss of life since the dinosaurs. And it's alarming because nature is actually part of who we are. And there's a global community, including us in this room, that are working really hard to make sure it remains part of who we will be for generations to come. So there was just a global summit to discuss the current nature emergency in biodiversity loss. And representatives from almost 200 countries gathered for COP15, the, convention, the UN Convention on Biodiversity, in Montreal in December in 2022. And the central purpose of the meeting was to hammer out a new biodiversity framework to replace the old one, um, and with agreed targets to be met by 2030. And the meeting was described as the last best chance to put species and ecosystems on a path to recovery by mid-century. Now, the meeting was largely successful. COP15 ended on December 19th, 3 a.m., when delegates from around the world signed the Kumyung Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, a landmark agreement to guide global action on nature through to 2030, hoping to put nature on a path to recovery for the benefit of all the world's people. Now, the Kumyung Montreal Biodiversity Framework has 23 action-orientated goals, uh, targets, for urgent action over the decade to 2030. And all the signatories, including Canada, are required to contribute to 23 new targets locally, regionally, provincially, and nationally. Now, a key theme that is baked into this new framework that was not present in the previous one is the rights and responsibilities of Indigenous peoples. So according to the United Nations, Indigenous lands make up around 20% of the Earth's territory. However, they contain 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. And so Indigenous peoples' role in safeguarding biodiversity has long been acknowledged. And so the move to recognize the rights of Indigenous peoples, as well as the centering of Indigenous knowledge in conservation, is significant and important. And the conversation is continuing. I want you to know that this, isn't, this doesn't mean that we've We've, we sort of like successfully included them. And so the target from COP15 that everyone is talking about is target three. It's that mathematical equation of 30 by 30. It's about durable, permanent protection. And so the target specifically is that we are to protect 30% of the Earth's lands, waters, and coastal areas by 2030. And so Canada signed onto the framework. We committed to the targets. And so target three is also Canada's goal. And so it's unclear if every country is going to commit to 30%, but we have. And so I want you to take a minute to think about what you think a protected area is. Is it a place without people? Is it a place without hunting? Is it a place without trails? Is it a place without cars? And so protected areas are generally geographically defined areas that can range from places that have really strict protections in place to maybe places where conservation is a byproduct of other things going on. And so I want you to, to remember that the conservation community, so the people that are working in this world, are, are putting their brains together thinking, what does conservation look like? Because it's important we have those conversations to reach 30%. It is a really big target. Okay, so when we think about target three and how it will translate for Canada, I'm sorry I'm going fast, I have so much to say. So currently 13.5% of land and 13.9% of ocean in Canada is protected. You can see by the map, the distribution and size of the conserved areas is really variable. So there's larger terrestrial and marine conservation areas in northern Canada uh, where human uses are often less intrusive. And so in landscapes and seascapes where there's more competing uses like here on PEI, Conserved areas tend to be smaller, but maybe more numerous. And so the percentage of land um, protected across the country varies greatly. 
with about 9% in Quebec to almost 20% in the Yukon. And so provincial and territorial governments will need to step up to meet the 30% target because they need to sort of recognize that they are crown governments in Canada and they have jurisdiction over land and natural resources. And so obviously, as well, indigenous governments across Canada have consistently stepped forward with their leading edge plans to conserve um, initiatives so to conserve in their traditional territories and support for indigenous led conservation is critical to, for Canada to deliver on that 30 by 30 target. Ooh, you can't even tell this is PEI. Uh, <laughs> this is PEI. If we hit the lights, you might see it better. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk about PEI for a second. I'm in a room with people who know about this island far more than I do. Um, but our current protected area target is 7%. And at the end of 2020, the media shared that PEI had reached about 4.5%. We are much higher than that now. Um, and thanks to the efforts to a lot of people in this room. Um, and there's um, some discussion about raising the target. However, nothing's official yet. But I want to take the emphasis off the target for the moment. Okay, so just bear with me. And I want you to consider our landscape. So PEI is 88% private land, which means bringing that land into protected areas on PEI means working with private landowners. Okay, so if we compare our landscape to some of our neighboring provinces, this so one's not too far from us, um, PEI has far less Crown land, provincial land, we call it provincial land here, I don't know why. Um, so other provinces are going to make different goals based on their landscapes. For instance, both BC and Quebec have already committed to protect 30% by 2030. So it's great to have goals, um, but it's unrealistic to think that PEI would ever have a goal of 30%. 30%. So to meet any goals here on PEI that we'd set on protected areas, we'd need to conserve a substantial amount of private land and put it under protected area legislation. Land that people live on, that has been in their family for generations, is being farmed, is being harvested, is being subdivided, is being sold to summer residents that want to come and live here. Our land dynamics and our provincial is, is very different from our provincial neighbors, so we need to remember it in this context. I also want to hit on the point, oh, two minutes, that conservation is more than a numbers game. Let's just throw out that protect area or target because it's not enough to deliver durable conservation outcomes. The quality of protected areas is, is important and we need to identify where are those areas that have high biodiversity, maybe are home to species at risk. We also need to ensure that conserved areas are, have comprehensive and long-term protection are managed effectively, and they're connected within a network of other protected areas. For instance, here on PEI, if we're going to target private land, we have money to spend, we've got to make sure we buy the right properties. Okay, so if we revisit, revisit to what Canada signed on to in December, at COP15, and what almost 200 governments from around the world signed on to, there was 23 targets. It wasn't just one, right? So we're all really fixated on target three. But there's 23 of them. Okay, so here's just some example um, of some of the other targets. So I mean, maybe one of them is focused on pollution and, and one of them is focused on alien species. And so maybe PEI maybe should not focus on target three. Okay, I'm almost done. So um, a lot of the discussion uh, about this new biodiversity framework is this phrase, this whole of society approach. The urgency and scale of biodiversity and climate crisis, so there's two crises happening, is so large that no single institution, government, or community alone can create a thriving natural world. So we cannot focus on one target, or we can't point to one government to take us there, or even one department within one government. You know, of course we need political will and recognition at the highest level of government, but we also need action and cooperation from all levels of government and by all actors of society. Okay, so I'm afraid I don't have a slide with a prescription of answers. Maybe someone else will. Okay, I'm finishing my thought. Um, but what I can say is that here on PEI, uh, we have something that's really hard to find somewhere else, and that is proximity. It's not unusual for us to run into public, public officials, industry leaders, organizational thinkers, waiting in line for coffee, maybe standing at the rink watching kids hockey, 
So we are inherently designed to have an enabling environment that promotes partnership. And if we leverage this proximity, we can come up with really innovative solutions. And the sum of all those contributions by a wide range of stakeholders can create immense collective impact. And so while we may not have a press conference announcing a 20,000 hectare protected area, we'll leave that to other provinces to make those announcements, we may be celebrating the first ever partnership, maybe bringing together unlikely partners to rebuild a wetland, or closing a fishing ground to restore habitat, or partnering to secure expensive piece of private land to save it from development. And so we can leverage our shared interest in working hard to make sure that the biodiversity on PEI remains part of who we will be for generations to come because everyone has a role to play in building a resilient natural world. Oh, thank you so much, Lana. Really, really interesting food for thought on our island land dynamics. And that was great. You know, I didn't have to hop on the piano at all, really. Um, and we're going to roll on into uh, our next speaker here now, uh, Jana Chevery from Ducks Unlimited Canada. Hi, folks. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many faces here in person. Great to have these events in person. <laughs> so my name is Jana Chivery, and I'm the head of conservation programs for Dex Limited Canada in Atlantic. Uh, that's a new role for me that I just took on last April. So um, pretty excited about that. Um, I thought I'd just start with a little bit about who we are and what we do. So Ducks Limited Canada is a private not-for-profit conservation organization, and we have offices all across Canada. Um, our main goal is to conserve, restore, and manage wetlands, and those wetlands are important for waterfowl, wildlife, and people. Uh, we've been restoring wetlands here in Atlantic Canada since the 1960s, and in PEI we have over 15,000 acres of wetland and associated upland habitat under protection. So I thought I'd go through a few of the benefits of wetlands. Um, so the first big benefit that wetlands provide is um, they provide habitat and they support biodiversity. They also improve our water quality through filtering of nutrients and sediments and contaminants from runoff. Um, they also help with flood mitigation and water attenuation. They can help with reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, through carbon sequestration. And they also provide recreational opportunities. So what are the greatest threats to biodiversity? Well, there's five main threats. Uh, the first being habitat loss and degradation. Uh, the next being climate change, pollution, invasive species, and species over-exploitation. I'm going to focus a little bit on habitat loss and degradation today. Uh, so we have a neat little uh, infographic here um, that uh, we'll kind of spool through, but uh, basically it's showing you that when you take away the natural features on the landscape, we're reducing the habitat that's available for species to survive. And this results in biodiversity loss. So looking at habitat loss on PEI, uh, historically many of the wetlands on PEI were ditched, drained, and infilled by our early European settlers. Uh, we don't know the exact amount of wetland loss that has historically occurred, uh, but rough estimates for the Atlantic region are anywhere between 50 to 75% loss, uh, depending on the area. Uh, today, wetlands make up about 6% of PEI's landscape. About 10% of PEI's existing wetlands were originally constructed in the 1800s. Uh, this was when European settlers built dams as sources of power for their grist mills, woolen mills, and in the 1900s for electricity. 
Uh, since the 1970s, Ducks Limited and the province of PEI have been managing many of these impalements uh, for wildlife habitat and for recreational opportunities. Uh, yep, yep, that's good, okay. <laughs> um, so today, Ducks Unlimited's program looks much different. Um, our main focus is on combating wetland loss, and we're doing that through small marsh restoration. So we started doing this type of work in the early 2000s, and we've been restoring or constructing small wetlands in partnership with landowners. Uh, so we typically sign like a 15 to 30 year agreement with the landowner to construct one of these wetlands on their property. And we know that these restored wetlands are providing habitat to a variety of species, including plants, waterfowl, and other birds, invertebrates, amphibians, and mammals. So what do we look for? Um, mainly we're looking for areas that are larger than a half an acre in size. Uh, we want to find poorly drained areas that have clay-based soils, so we know that those areas will hold water. Uh, we typically take a look at the vegetation and the surrounding upland, um, and we look at the topography and slope, so we want to build these in a low sloped area. And we also have to consider what the water source will be when we construct these wetlands. So will this uh, wetland fill up with water from precipitation or will it be from runoff from adjacent land? Um, these areas have to be outside of a stream and not already classified as a wetland. We also look at past alterations in the area. So sometimes it's quite evident that there's been ditching done or there's some tile drainage. Um, so that's really important to know and we're trying to decide what, what site we can restore. So in terms of biodiversity on these small marsh projects, I think we're just really starting to understand the benefits of restored wetlands for non-waterfowl species. Um, Birds Canada and Ducks Limited uh, published a research paper in 2018 that looked at multi-species benefits of wetland conservation, and they used data that was collected through Birds Canada Marsh Monitoring Program in Ontario. Uh, and in this study, they found that occupancy was significantly greater at managed project sites compared to unmanaged sites. And they had looked at 42 managed sites and 52 nearby unmanaged sites. So we're hoping that we can continue this research into the Atlantic as well and get some numbers for some of our small marsh program here. Um, DU is also starting to work in the prairies on a global biodiversity framework that will use citizen science as well as research observations to better understand what species are utilizing managed wetlands. And again, we're hoping that that uh, global biodiversity framework will uh, be utilized here in Atlantic as well. So what can you do? Uh, the first thing you could do is you could reach out to a local conservation organization or a watershed group and find out how you can protect and conserve wetlands on your property. Uh, there are many options available, such as conservation agreements, restrictive covenants. Uh, you can designate your land under the Natural Areas Protection Act or the Wildlife Conservation Act or you can donate or sell your property uh, to one of these conservation organizations to ensure that the land is protected in perpetuity. Uh, in terms of wetland restoration, you could look for poorly drained areas on your property that could be restored to a wetland and feel free to reach out to Ducks Unlimited and we'll do a site assessment to see if, if that site is a viable option. Uh, it's also important to support the PEI wetland conservation policy and stand up against wetland loss. Uh, PEI has one of the strongest wetland policies in the country that includes a no net loss statement. Um, so wetlands can't be altered unless it's deemed by the province to be in the greater public good. Uh, so public support for the policy will ensure that it remains in place and that wetlands are protected into the future. And lastly, tell your friends about the important benefits that wetlands provide and how they will support biodiversity. Thank you. Great, Jenna. Thank you so much. We didn't even have to give you the two minute warning, I don't think, wow. 
Um, all right. This has just been wonderfully fascinating so far. Um, I have to also mention on a side note, uh, I just have always loved the name Ducks Unlimited. Like ever since I remember, you know, when I was a kid seeing the Ducks Unlimited commercial and I'd always be thinking like the person who started this must have just really loved Ducks. Like, I don't know the history of Ducks Unlimited, who actually did start it, but that person just obviously loved, like they were like, I love Ducks so much they need to be unlimited unlimited ducks is what we need and but how do the other wildlife species feel about that like about ducks being singled out we can discuss this later um maybe at the break or something but um next we're gonna get uh gary schneider up here from mcphail woods all right here we go Thank you. Um, thanks to the Island Nature Trust, Janelle, for setting this up for getting me here. That was great. Um, I have a great slideshow for you. And you don't have to do much except look at good pictures. I only have one thing I'm going to make you work on. So I'm going to press. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you can tell me what type of lion that is. That would be really helpful. That's that's your first quiz. I wanted to, I, when I do my uh, forest courses for the university, we always start with this one because people make such a mistake in thinking that biodiversity is about numbers and it's not, okay? So this is like me sort of gently hitting you in the head with a hammer to say, you going and adding a lion or an invasive species, or a Japanese larch, or whatever it is, that has nothing to do with improving biodiversity. It's not about numbers. And I have good friends who come to me and say, I have 64 species of trees on my property. And I say, well, that's kind of cool, right? Do they fit together, right? Are they doing really anything for biodiversity? One of the big things we've said with McPhail Woods is that I don't really care how many trees you plant. I want to know how many seed sources you're putting in place. So that's our big goal. That's the way to get big footprints for your ecological work. If I go and plant three red oak and they spread, that's just wonderful. It's going to take a little bit longer before I get a thousand red oak, but that's not important. It means we can do so much good work. And we see this at places like the, the church in Belfast, which somebody had planted red oak, and then you see 60 feet away, there are smaller red oak, and another 100 feet away, there's smaller red oak. And after a while, there's just little seedlings. But those oak on that church property have spread throughout that area, right? And that means there's a whole bunch of work going on while we're here at things like this, right? We don't actually have to go out and plant all those species. This is my only work for you. I love this quote from Fritjof Capra, who's a great thinker and philosopher. He says that a diverse ecosystem will also be resilient because it contains many species with overlapping ecological functions that can partially replace one another. When a particular species is destroyed by a severe disturbance so that a link in the network is broken, a diverse community will be able to survive and reorganize itself in other words, the more complex the network is, the more complex its patterns of interconnections, the more resilient it would be. So that diversity is really important for us, right? We forget that at our own peril. Right? Native plants, that's all you get. That's all the work, right? So we use native plants in all kinds of things. And at first, I started growing them because they were rare. That's how foolish I was. And then I started falling in love with them and thinking, oh my God, these are beautiful plants, right? So this is a, a mix of red baneberry and ostrich ferns and the white form of the red baneberry. We use them again. We go to people's properties and they've been planting potentillas and boxwoods and stuff like that and they can't figure out what's wrong with that. But there's so many beautiful native plants. Hopefully. 
We use them in woodland settings. So again, part of it is getting off your lawn, right? Doing something different, but all those things are beautiful and they improve biodiversity. Uh, swamp milkweed. And again, I show you these slides because they're simple things you can do, right? I will admit, I'm not a genius around plants. I have no horticulture degrees, but man, I grow a lot of stuff. And it's because I put the effort into it. So I think I'm a good example for people. You don't have to say, we're gonna wait for government to do something. And they may or may not have the capacity to do that, but we sure as hell can go out and collect acorns, right? We can re rebuild uh, red oak populations in this province. Our provincial tree, we have so few of them. We can do all this stuff. And it's, I inspire myself sometimes. That sounds really weird, but <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, looking at it, I remember we, we uh, Kate McCory would come out and do workshops for us. She's been an incredible supporter for years. And I'd grown something quite rare and that her and I had collected the seeds for, maybe round leaf dogwood or something. And she said, you didn't even wait for a government grant. I thought, that's really neat. We didn't, we just put the seeds in the ground and grew them, right? And I think again, everybody can do this stuff because if you can garden, if you can grow kale and kohlrabi, you can grow a ton of different things. We put swamp milkweed in the ground. The first year it started seeding, the kids from the kids camp said, there's caterpillars all over your swamp milkweed. It was like, nah, that can't happen, right? You can't just build it and they will come. But we had them the first year. And that's again for almost no money. The public can make huge impacts on a quite rare species. And it's amazing. Thousands and thousands and thousands of milkweed are growing on the island now. People are really excited about it. It's lovely. I get emails of people showing me caterpillars and things like that. Not just Again, the milkweed's a beautiful plant, but the things that it attracts are incredibly beautiful. These are hummingbird moths. My talk, I don't have to stop until they tell me to stop because I got so many slides, you'll never see them all anyway. <laughs> this is a cut leaf coneflower. I didn't even know it existed, but this tall, beautiful plant for uh, all kinds of pollinators, midges, wasps. And I thought, again, this is a great plant for landscaping because it's so beautiful. It's a great plant for pollinators because it's so interesting. Then in the fall, I start seeing 50 or 60 uh, goldfinches come and feed on the seed. And I thought, this plant has so many benefits, it's gonna drive me crazy. <laughs> Joe pie weed, it really is a weed, but man, it's a beautiful plant, right? We've forgotten a lot of these things are gorgeous and great for pollinators and other things, but we think of them as weeds, right? And part of that is we don't know anything about them as a landscape plant because they don't teach that at universities and colleges that teach landscaping, right? They teach portentillas and boxwoods and things like that. Uh, seaside goldenrod is just one of the most beautiful plants you can think of, that brilliant yellow, and yet we never use it as a landscape plant. Blue flag iris, again, I started taking close-up pictures of things. This is actually one from Beth Orr. Beth, a lot of these pictures are someone else's, but they're from McPhail or that area. When you look at a blue flag iris closely, it says beautiful. I'll finish on time, don't you worry. Uh, <laughs> it's as beautiful a plant as you can find anywhere. So tulips, roses, all the other things. You look at a blue flag iris closely, and the coloration in that flower is just gorgeous. Another good plant for pollinators. This is another plant that Kate McCory found, uh, amongst other people. It's a uh, Canada anemone. has the most beautiful white flower. It's just a gorgeous plant. So rare on PEI, and yet it's one of the easiest plants to grow. Um, some woodland plants that are really good. Um, Bluebead lily, if you see it in the fall. Uh, Corn lily, corn flower, if you see it in the spring. Another rare plant, yellow violet, which again, I've only found on one place on the island, maybe more. 
so rare, so easy to grow. So sometimes we think of rarities as difficult, but some of the rarities are the most easy plants to grow. This is bunchberry, little dogwood. I'm going to race through these. I, got I really like this. <laughs> Trilliums. I had somebody come over from uh, the Botanical Gardens of Wolfville, and she said, you grow trilliums? I said, yeah. She said, well, how do you grow them? I said, I collect the seed and put them in the ground. I said, why? <laughs> and she had been reading stuff, and it sounded so difficult because the ants go through and move the seed because there's a little bit of protein on the seed and stuff. But you don't need that, right? You collect the seed and you plant them. Dutchman's breeches, again, a gorgeous little plant. Spring ephemeral, comes out in the spring, stays for a little while. Um, but again, it's one of these plants that really adds to the biodiversity. The reason I wanted to show you these is that the more we do ourselves, right, the more seed sources we put in place, the better it is for everything because you start seeing witch hazel and ironwood and all kinds of stuff seeding in around your initial work. Good to go? Great. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Gary. For a man who inspires himself sometimes, you've certainly inspired us tonight. Wow. And I do have to also say that I think I just realized um, being it just was such an engaging presentation you did there. It felt, I th oh, these are all, this is all of them. <laughs> the strobe, this is now the strobe version of the presentation. Um, it's basically like your, your PEI's, um, biodiversity expert, like forestry manager version of Bob Ross is what I was thinking. And I love Bob Ross and, and I love you. That was, that's just amazing, Gary. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I want to know how many seed sources you're putting in place. Excellent statement. It's really, really wise, wise words. Um, so we're going to bring uh, the four uh, presenters uh, up here, and you can have a seat here at this table. And now we're going to open up the floor. And actually, we have the first, first contestant up. <laughs> stepping up to the mic. Do you want? We can maybe. We can even lower that for you. I'm asking the question of all four of you. I have 104 acres that we're managing organically, and we recently planted 150 red oaks, just after Fiona, because I was so upset. But my challenge to the four of you is how to get the government online, because the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. We're farmers. We talk to agriculture and we talk to forestry. They don't talk to each other. They actually, at one time, forestry would pay us to put in hedgerows and agriculture would pay us to tear them out. I, oh, somebody's heard this before. I've tried to get a multi-species trees and plants for the, the ancient, from 1858 laneways on the farm because it was built for horse-drawn wagons and our, our ma machines don't fit. We said, let's put something in for the critters. I can't get anything from the government because they don't have the vision for that. In addition, there's the other challenge. The government does have a no net loss, Hunter River. The last time I checked, they still haven't replaced what they destroyed, and it's been a very long time. If you look at the rules for coastline, Point de Roche, the rules are there, they're not obeying them. So it's like, we've got speed limits, well why obey the speed limits? They're not going to enforce them. And that's my challenge to you and to everybody, because it's nuts. I feel like I'm in Catch-22. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Did anyone want to respond to that? Sure. Perfect. 
And actually, I should have said, uh, I just realized it would be great if, uh, if when you come up to ask a question, if you want to state your name. And what is, what is your name? Rita Jackson. Thank you, Rita. Yes, I just uh, think, you know, we're the conservation community here, but we have to get out to a broader <laughs> um, audience and really people now are thinking about, you know, climate change. They're thinking about some of these issues. And so it has to, you know, go further. And we have to do more, I guess, um, maybe rebel rousing or whatever <laughs> to, uh, to make this a, you know, broader issue for society. And I think it's totally fine to be cranky with government. I think they deserve a lot of stuff. We need to be cranky with them. Problem is, we have often people in charge who don't understand anything about environments. So we have an environment minister that, it's funny you brought up Point de Roche, but we have a minister that really doesn't understand things um, and makes it difficult to have changes there. But I think if people tell you that they don't have enough trees to plant in mixed woods or they can't, you know, they can only do monocultures, you'll have to tell them that's not acceptable. And nobody's going to want to hear that and nobody's going to want to be called at home if they're an MLA and be told that they're cranky about this stuff. We're just a very polite place, and so we don't do that enough. But we know better. We just don't do it, right? So I, I'm, I applaud your crankiness. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I'm good. Great. Anyone else uh, have any questions for the panel? It was all such fascinating material. Engaging subject matter. Oh, yeah. Did you want to come on up to the, the mic? And... Excellent. Um, yeah, the, this is going to sound like a broken record. We're just going to kind of go over some of the things that Rita said again. Um, I think was Lana who talked about the whole of society approach, a whole of company approach, and that is fine and it's important and it's important that all the players play together but let, I, I, I always a little bit nervous about when we talk about this whole of all the partners approach and same thing that Gary is saying uh, forget the whole of government approach and let the government somehow off the hook uh, this idea of the go the different government players working together this is very important is what Rita said and uh, just let's not pretend that some of the things that we need to do uh, can happen in the absence of a government that is kind of working in a functional way. And this is, is government intervention has always been necessary since they started closing seasons for games or not allowing certain activities. The province has uh, jurisdiction on land use and uh, the government has to work in a coordinated manner. And it's just an observation. So what do you think, because, Lana, because you talk about the whole society, but I just don't, just kind of, yeah. yeah. So I was, I was just trying to go really fast, but they, they say whole of government as well. <laughs> um, and so a, a lot of the language coming out of COP15 is about whole of society, but it is about whole of government. So. Um, I agree that I, and I wanted to point out that I think sometimes when we feel frustrated, we, we want to yell at one department. And we just want to yell at that department that's in charge of forestry, that's in charge of environment. And um, I think when we, we're dealing with a crisis as large as biodiversity loss, like as large as climate change, um, we can't expect the leadership to come from one department. And so I have the benefit of working with a national organization. So I hear rumblings um, and insight into what's happening at other provincial governments. And so um, I know that there is some discussion with some of our neighboring provinces uh, to write intergovernmental commitments on biodiversity. 
And that's what I want to see. I want to see people all coming together. She's like, okay, so I'm in charge of, of this department. What can I do from an aquaculture perspective that protects biodiversity? What can I do from a health perspective that protects biodiversity? So I agree. I think it needs to live in all different apart departments. And so, yeah, so I think um, whole of society is used and also whole of government is kind of used together. Um, but the whole of society, so one of the things that um, also came out of this new framework that wasn't pre present in the previous one is industry and the private sector. And so really looking to the private sector for leadership as well, um, because they are the creative thinkers, they're innovative, they're often more nimble than government. Um, sometimes they have leverage with government. And so we need to look to the private sector as well to show leadership in this area too. So. You see the targets, right? They, 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 what happens is that who, who signed who signed the agreement? Uh, the COP. The, the, if, uh, if the parties are yes. governments, and you look at some of the targets, and uh, I mean, one government department never never mind one level of government cannot uh, if they don't work together, mm -hmm. they're not gonna there's not gonna be a way to achieve those targets and. Uh, uh, you know, some, you read some of the targets and you scratch your head because they, how they signed for it. Yep. How are they going to do it? Mm -hmm. How are they going to at least show they did it, which yes, is another yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, they have to work together to do that because, again, yeah, like yeah. you said, it can't be one department that's in charge of the 23 targets. So. All right, thank you very much. Yes. Paul Naima, I've got a, a two-part question for Lana, maybe. Just to, to follow up on your, on your comments earlier about the fact that I think it's only 12% of the land in PEI is publicly owned, the rest of it's privately owned. What can we do to incent private landowners or encourage private landowners to protect that land? And a little bit more, but what does that mean to protect that? Second part of the question is, Given that it's going to be a real challenge for us to get to 30 here in PEI, we probably won't. Of the other 22 targets, which ones are most realistically for us here in PEI to, to focus on? Um, great questions. <laughs> um, um, so to your first point about um, so PEI being um, 80% private land. So again, I work for the nationwide organization, so I always like to picture, I try not to compare PEI with the rest of Canada. I try to think of it as like a tiny European country. <laughs> um, so I don't feel like I'm inadequate. Um, and so um, I think, uh, um, so what can we do? So I think private, private landowners have lots of options. So we've got a couple land trusts in the room. We love to take these kind of phone calls and talk about land. Um, and, and you also have options to put your land under uh, the Legislative Protected Area Act uh, in this province, which is incredible. That does not exist in other jurisdictions. It's incredible. We should be very proud of it. Um, and so there's all there's lots of you know sort of you could strike partnerships with Docs Unlimited Canada. So there's lots of sort of um, things in our toolbox that what we can do as private landowners. We could if we have a if we live in the city like I do. I went to McPhail last year and bought a bunch of native plants. Um, and so um, I think that, uh, and, the, and the land trusts are working hard to help landowners who want to work with us and sort of see their, their land protected. Um, but uh, we will never, PEI will, may never have a protected area goal of 30%. It's probably not going to be ours. Um, in terms of the other targets, and so um, again, I think when the COP15 conversation wrapped up, everyone fixated on target three. It was the most fancy, popular one. To, and so I, I really wanted my talk to say that that may not be ours. And we, there are so many other um, of the targets, maybe PEI skill sets will really resonate. Um, and, um, and so I hope that um, in, the, in the aftermath of this big, powerful global summit, there is an intergovernmental group formed on PEI that includes a lot of leadership that says sort of what are those that, that we can, that we can um, sort of tackle and, and head in on. Um, we are an island. Can we eliminate invasive species? So there, I think we have um, a lot of potential here that we can just kind of think of like, you know, 
what can PEI do that's unique that maybe some of our other partners are not able to do and, um, and we can make um, magic happen that way. And so, um, and it may not be, again, like I said, sort of making those big announcements of 20,000 hectares that they may make in New Brunswick, but we can't do that here, but we're gonna make announcements about other really cool things we're doing. So it's looking at the targets um, and, uh, and, and sort of coming together as different government leadership. Um, and I would love to be invited to that meeting. I know many people here would as well. Uh, um, um, but I don't have any specific answers yet, but, um, but I, think, I think the work needs to be done. And we, we just wrapped up in December, so Canada did sign on. I think the federal government's gonna be looking to the provinces to show leadership, so we have to get our ducks in order. Great, yeah, uh, we do have time for one more question. Did you want to? Yeah, perfect. The most invasive species in the world is us. <laughs> Prince Edward Island has the most rapidly growing human population in Canada, and we seem to be proud of that. Uh, we have a rapidly growing rate of uh, economic production growth rate, and people seem to be proud of that as well. My question for the panel is, are the goals of uh, COP compatible with increasing human population growth, population growth of, of people and economic growth? And if not, should we, we collectively as an environmental community, say things which are perhaps difficult and contrary and controversial and possibly even cranky about what we can do and what we can't do? in order to achieve conservation goals. I have people who talk to me about uh, population growth. And you know, it somewhat drives me crazy because it seems to be a way of not dealing with the other issues. So I'm not saying that we might look at it and say, we got too many people here, but right now, we got too many people using most of the resources. The problem isn't overpopulation, overpopula it is actually who's using how many resources. We can fix a lot of that stuff, right? We don't need that, like I, I drive around Stratford and I see castles going up, right? That's not, nothing to do with population, right? We've got to deal with it on that issue where how many resources are how few people using those resources, right? I think that's a way bigger pop, uh, problem. The inequities that are associated with that are way bigger problems than mere population. And I think sometimes the population distracts us from dealing with the real issues. I know I'm, I'm people may be cranky with that response, but I do think it's a way of saying, we don't really have to change the stuff we're doing now, we just need to, think about a way to, to limit population growth. And I think we, we're making a mistake because that's not the real target here. Anybody else want to jump into that? <laughs> really great question to finish off this first half. Are you sure no one else wants to? Oh, Rosemary would like to. Well. Population growth is, is being uh, pushed by the government as, you know, driving the economy. And uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not against population growth, um, but what we do is we rob the poorest countries of the world of their best talent, and what we should be doing is dealing with 70 million refugees in the world. So, uh, yeah, um, I don't think our message is right uh, right now, like, let's bring in more people so we can have a driving economy. Yeah. Yep. Well said. All right, well, uh, could you please join me in a big round of, our of, of applause for our four presenters. <laughs> oh, just a really engaging, uh, fascinating first half. Thank you all, all four of you. And so we're going to take a little break. Uh, help yourself to.
the delights back there. And once again, go out into the lobby if you'd like to and check out that game. And uh, also put your call to action on the tree. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I think that helped to round up uh, the remaining people out there. It was actually, I think, mostly my father just just having a chat with people out there, holding up the, the second. <laughs> I'm blaming it on you, Dad. <laughs> no, um, hopefully everyone enjoyed uh, the intermission, and uh, hopefully you did play that, that uh, seed identifying game, and we're going to have Cassidy uh, come up here at the end of the night and tell you who the winner is. And hope you put your call to action on the tree as well. And if, if by chance you didn't get a chance to do that, please do so before the end of the night. And um, yeah, uh, we're going to bring up um, the first speakers uh, for uh, the, the second half. I just also wanted to mention um, one other thing. Um, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this uh, because Teresa Doyle told me I, I should, and I was worried I was gonna forget to do it, but. We have um, a show going on on Earth Day at the Guild, um, so April 22nd, and it's a Songs for a Small Planet night, and it features Teresa Doyle, uh, myself, um, Megan Blanchard, and a couple of other artists as well, and we'll be doing uh, songs on the subject of, uh, of the Earth and um, environmentally friendly lifestyles and doing what we can for the planet. So hopefully, um, if, you, if you're free on Earth Day night, it's a Saturday night, I believe, this year. Please come out and join us. It would be lovely to see you there. Um, and I think that's all the items I was going to mention off the top. So uh, I'm going to bring up the first speaker of the second half, and it's uh, Aleda Tweeten of the Mi'kmaq Confederacy of PEI. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> Kwe, Dasi, hola, bonjour, hello. My name is Aleda Tweeten, and I'm working alongside with Mi'kmaq Confederacy and Island Nature Trust as Mi'kmaq Engagement Coordinator for the Forested Landscape Priority Place Initiative for PEI. I have Cree ancestry from Fort LaCorne, Saskatchewan, and I am a descendant of the first indigenous fur traders who helped found the Hudson Bay Trading Company. My ancestors were involved in some key pieces of Canadian history, including the Red River Rebellion, and my great aunt was Maud Mackay, the first indigenous woman to graduate from University of Saskatchewan. I am fortunate to have paper trails, articles, and information about my history as so many of my Indigenous brothers and sisters do not. And in that, I am grateful for my forefathers and foremothers whose two worlds merged as they had friendship with settlers. And I am here today to discuss that collaboration around Mi'kmaq and non-Mi'kmaq conservation as it relates to Prince Edward Island. In the spirit of reconciliation, we are here today on unceded Mi'kmaq land that we all strive to protect and nurture to cultivate a future with healthy and diverse protected forests. Essentially, my role in this project is to bridge the conservation efforts of Indigenous land stewards and non-Indigenous land stewards. I feel this path that I find myself on is not coincidental, considering my background. I am pleased to talk to you today about some of the work that we're doing. Eduamuk. The philosophy that I'm following is two-eyed scene or Eduamuk. This approach is learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous ways of knowing and from the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledge conservation. Eduamuk is coined by Dr. Elder Albert Marshall of Unamaki, Cape Breton. This concept is globally recognized in this collaborative approach. In the second image, the upper left corner <clears throat> is the two-row wampum, 
and that's representing the oldest treaty between Europeans and Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois, or Six Nation people, with one row being Indigenous and the other being European as they move side by side on the river of life and they are to avoid overlapping or interfering with one another. And this was one of the oldest treaties in the 1600s. Um, the whole non-interference, we, we know how that happened. <clears throat> the next image on the top right of the water is from the Australian Aboriginal people from Elko Island, about six kilometers from the northeast coast in the Northern Territory of Australia. And it, that image depicts the word called ganma, or whirlpool, where the fresh water swirls and mixes with the salt water. We would call that brackish water here. And it continues into the deep sea and beyond into Indonesia. The Yolamgu woman is said to have sung the crying or mourning song when her uncle passed away, as the sound carried across the water, as there's no clear separation between environment and person. And of course, the final image is the doctor um, from Dr. Elder Albert Marshall, and that's the two-eyed seeing. Aligning with indigenous ways of thinking, there's a seven-generation principle whereby thoughts about the future generations in, prevail in terms of land stewardship. If we thought that way, then seven generations from now, or about 840 years from now, would be the year 2863. So with these COP targets of 30 by 30, it's a little more manageable how we can think about that. But this is an inherent understanding that there is not any separation between humans and the planet. Essentially, no planet means no humans. There's an understanding that we're all just as important as trees, stars, oceans, lakes, animals, fish, and birds. Nothing is more important, hence the circle. There's always a balance, and to be in harmony is what we are striving for. What impacts something will impact another thing. This holistic view of, med of the medicine wheel is the way of life for us, and in terms of ourselves, it represents emotional, spiritual, physical, and mental or intellectual wellness. It's our medicines that shows the four sacred medicines, tobacco for the east, sweet grass for the south, sage for the west, and cedar for the north. It includes all parts as we seek elders and knowledge keepers to pass along the wisdoms, stories, and information on how to live according to medicine wheel and the seven sacred or the grandfather teachings. Sadly, due to colonization, land acquisition, residential schools, land reservations, and racism, much of the traditional knowledge sharing has been interrupted, but it is not gone, it is not lost. We need to nurture and protect what we have and conserve it for future generations. Traditional knowledge, like our forests, needs to be protected and treasured. This next slide um, incorporates the seven sacred teachings and um, if you have an opportunity to ever connect with an elder at some point and understand these teachings better, this is obviously a very quick snapshot. As uh, Julie Peltier-Lush mentioned earlier tonight, truth as represented by the turtle, humility by the wolf, love by the eagle or giptu, courage and bravery, the bear, respect, the bison, honesty is represented by the raven or kichisabi, which is the Sasquatch, depending on the indigenous culture across Turtle Island. And finally, uh, wisdom with the beaver. So that whole idea of harmony and balance is super important in indigenous culture, personal values, way of life. It's just how we exist. Um, so essentially, if we have harmony, it's good. Um, as any of you who have had a flat tire know, it impacts the rest of everything, not just the side that the tire is flat on. Part of the work that we're going to do and we are doing is also um, cultivating with our elders and with our knowledge keepers um, medicine wheel gardens. And these can be cultivated for ceremony, education, health and wellness. 
They are spaces for knowledge keepers and elders to pass along their knowledge. To, uh, usually a traditional medicine man or a medicine woman would have a very close relationship with the person whom they are caring for or to treat or heal. And they would be with the person to watch him or her carefully to ensure that they are um, responding well to the use of the medicine. So when we think of sharing Indigenous culture and knowledge, it's really important to understand it's not just something we put in a book so you can have that plant and then you're going to be well. There's a whole relationship. There's a relationship with the earth. There's a relationship with the person who's caring for you as well. And I look at the work that we're doing here in that way. Um, it would be wonderful right now if we had <clears throat> all kinds of um, Indigenous people on Prince Edward Island be able to do all the work that needs to be done, but it comes down to capacity. So right now we're in the relationship phase, um, and we are doing things like talking with elders, doing black ash conservation and at species at risk with um, different elders. There's a Pathfinders program on Lennox Island with Blake Bernard, um, and we have Miss Helena Perry, our Indigenous chartered herbalist here, and she's actively doing medicine walks along with um, on Island Nature Trust property. So that's a very big collaboration that we're doing with Island Nature Trust. I'm going to move along here. Um, I have two minutes left. I'm just wondering if I might. It is important, and it, it has been mentioned. Uh, 370 million Indigenous people represent thousands of languages and different cultures around the world, and they inhabit 20 to 25% of the Earth's territory, and that contains 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. And that's a sign that Indigenous people are very effective land stewards. Partnerships with Indigenous land stewards is essential, and traditional knowledge comes from generational lived experience continuously passed along. Indigenous people live close with the land and have the most connection to the land. And if you contrast that with that individual privatization development that leads to climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss, it's very different. So a solution, right to self-determination, under Article 3 of the United Nations of Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. We have wonderful elders on our island. This is Elder Judy Clark, who resides in Abigail First Nation, or Scotchford. And she is an incredible human being and does so much with missing, murdered, and indigenous women and girls as well. And we do work with her brother, Elder Fran Jadis, also residing there. And he um, is incredible to talk to and makes all kinds of black ash baskets and has since he was six. There's a video on YouTube about that if you want. Finally, a quick challenge um, for all of you in the room, maybe you already know, is to look up um, and, to, and to do some action. So part of the two I'd seen requires a responsibility to act. Um, look up the TRC calls to action and as well as read the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aleda. That was a powerful presentation. Yeah, excellent way to, to start off the second half. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll bring up the next speaker in just a moment. Um, I, I realized I knew I was forgetting something at uh, when I was greeting you after intermission there. And Rosemary uh, from Nature PEI just let me know that at the back table there, um, just that high top table there, yes being pointed out in a lovely way. Um, there are these really great pamphlets, so informative, um, just outlining a lot of what Rosemary was speaking about, uh, the species at risk on PEI. And it's, yeah, really well laid out in these pamphlets. So please get one on your way out. And uh, just, uh, I'm going to bring up the next speaker, but I also, I wanted to mention just before I introduce her, um, she is uh, from the province of PEI and just wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, she's an employee with the province. She doesn't represent government, 
doesn't rep- represent government. And we're always encouraged, of course, to uh, reach out to our local MLAs with concerns or feedback. But nonetheless, we would be remiss, of course, if we didn't uh, include the province of, of PEI, a representative at the table here tonight. So it's going to be excellent to hear what she has to say. And her name is Julie Lynn Zahavich uh, from the province of PEI. Please welcome her up. Thank you. It's okay if you're cranky with me. I am just an employee of the government. <laughs> Um, and I'm here today to share the work of the PEI Forested Landscape Priority Place for Species at Risk. Um, and so I'll hop right in because I have a lot of material to cover in only 10 minutes. So yeah, I, okay, I work for the uh, PEI Department of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action in the Forest, Fish, and Wildlife Division, and I'm kind of in the Fish and Wildlife section. So I'll start in 2018 uh, when federal, provincial, territorial governments agreed to the pan-Canadian approach to transforming species at risk in Canada. So it's an agreement that really um, sort of shifts the focus from working on single species projects to more multi-species and ecosystem-based approaches, moving from broad independent efforts to more uh, targeted and collaborative efforts, and changing the emphasis to uh, from assessment and planning really into implementation. And so priority places across Canada are one way that we are implementing the pan-Canadian approach to transforming species at risk in Canada. There are 11 federal, provincial, territorial priority places across Canada. They're in green, uh, although it looks very bright here um, across the country. Um, There are three in the Atlantic region. We have the PEI Forested Landscape Priority Place in Nova Scotia. There is Southwest Nova Scotia or Gespawick. And in New Brunswick, there is the St. John River Valley Um, or Willustuck. Uh, There are also 15 community-nominated priority places. Those were um, open to the public or community groups to identify. We do have one in Prince Edward Island. It uh, covers the north shore of PEI, and it's coordinated by Island Nature Trust with multiple partners. And those are meant to sort of um, complement the priority places that were identified by governments. So here today to talk about the forested landscape priority place for species at risk. Uh, We call it the FLPP, so if I refer to it as that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, And it covers all of forest, all forest and PEI. So it is a species at risk focused project. The colors are different in this presentation. This is an orange in my presentation, but that's okay. Um, So these are the species at risk that are associated with our forest and PEI. We have 13 Kosiwik assessed species. That's the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. So we've got six birds, four lichens, two mammals and one vascular plant. Um, There are some asterisks besides some of these lichens because they are new records for PEI that we didn't know about um, until we started looking for them through the Forested Landscape Priority Place. So kind of neat that we have some of these um, rare lichens in PEI. There are also over 300 uh, rare species or high priority species that we're interested in working on in the Forested Landscape Priority Place. And so um, I started at the province in 2020 um, as the coordinator for the Forested Landscape Priority Place. And the first thing we did was sort of strike a a group to come together and talk about um, what we're going to do. And so a lot of the groups that have spoken tonight are involved in this initiative, and you can see them here. And so the first thing we did, or one of the first things we did, was create a shared vision for the future of PEI forests. And that is... Species at risk are thriving in diverse and connected forest ecosystems that are connected and cared for by islanders. And so, oh, this was a lot bigger in my presentation too. Something went wrong, but that's okay. So first thing we wanted to do was identify uh, what do we want to conserve? And so we identified some forest conservation targets. We've got forest of wetlands, riparian forests, forested uplands, and coastal forests and crumpholts. And Krumholtz was a new word for me uh, when I started on this. It's those um, sort of stunted, windblown spruce that you see on the coast. Um, They're called Tuckamore trees in Newfoundland, if you're familiar with that. And the idea being, if we conserve these habitat targets, we're also conserving those nested targets within them, including species at risk, culturally significant species, other species of conservation concern, human health and well-being benefits, and ecosystem services. So these are habitat conservation targets. These are our ecosystem services, human health and well-being benefits that we, if we conserve our targets, we also conserve these benefits as well. 
And so part of the work of the team was to identify what pressures are acting on these ecosystem targets. We wouldn't be here if they weren't threatened in some way. So we identified a number of pressures or threats that are acting on the forested landscape. These are the higher ranking ones. So we identified incompatible wood harvesting, invasive species, roads and service corridors, climate change, agricultural expansion, and residential development. And so we really wanted to create a shared understanding of the conservation situation we're working in. So we really had to understand what's driving these pressures. So what we did in 2020 and 2021 was gather as a group for these sort of pressure focused workshops, looking at each of these pressures individually. We invited um, experts in the field um, and really tried to you know, understand the context that we're working in. And the result of that were these really intimidating models. So don't worry. Um, these are, uh, what I really need you to understand is that the, the green are our conservation targets, so the forest. The pressures are in pink, so those are, uh, this one is invasive species, so invasive species. The orange boxes are those contributing factors, so the root cause, causes of invasive species uh, in PEI. And then as a team, what we did was uh, try to identify what kind of strategies we could implement to directly target those contributing factors or root causes of these pressures, and that's what the yellow uh, hexagons are. So they're strategies that if we implement, we'll be addressing those root causes and hopefully um, alleviating some of the pressure on our forested landscape. So um, the next sort of step once we understood what we were working in is just to start doing some of this stuff. So this is the invasive species situation model. And what we did, um, these are some strategies here and you can't read them, so I'll, I'll sort of try to read them for you. Um, some of them were um, support the education efforts of the Invasive Species Council, support their Don't Move Firewood campaign, build capacity within uh, watershed groups and other conservation groups to address invasive species, um, and things like that. So that the, the overarching strategy then was to support the Invasive Species Council, uh, which is a great active group, they're here tonight, um, to hire staff um, who are also here tonight, and to implement some of these strategies. So that's what we did. For the last two years, we've been supporting the Invasive Species Council. They've hired three and or plus staff, and they've been doing great work um, on invasive species across the island. So that's just one example of some projects we've been doing, um, and here are some more. Um, they kind of fit into these broad categories. So site and area stewardship, we definitely have the Invasive Species Council um, working on management of invasive species. We've supported McPhail Woods to develop some really handy resources on using native plants in restoration. Uh, we've funded them to develop some really great YouTube videos on creating patch cuts when you're doing ecological forestry. We've supported Island Nature Trust to run some really neat walks for landowners who are interested in doing stewardship on their own land. We've done um, some basic research and monitoring. So we've also supported McPhail Woods to really um, improve our understanding of these coastal forests and crumholds. So they've been doing some really neat research into that. Again, we have the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center doing some targeted surveys. They're the folks that found those um, really interesting lichen records. Um, we've also uh, worked with some other partners. We've done a connectivity analysis of natural ecosystems in PEI, so we know where those pinch points are. Two minutes, awesome. Um, in the forested landscape, so we can identify, you know, what areas are most valuable for us to conserve. And we've got some modeling done to show where species at risk are on our landscape, which also informs our land acquisition. Um, we've been doing lots of training and capacity building with groups. Um, uh, we've got some <laughs> documents that the Federation of PEI Municipalities has developed to try to build capacity with the municipality staff to incorporate conservation into their land use plans. Um, we've, <laughs> over the last couple of years, supported conservation partners, INT and the Nature Conservancy, through this program and other federal provincial programs to acquire hundreds of acres across PEI for Natural Area Protection Act. And I think the biggest thing we've done is bring these groups together um, and start building relationships and, and communicating and working on things together rather than working on things alone. And I think um, we've done a fairly good job, but we've still got lots of work to go. Um, so our next steps, we have been extended to 2026, so this work will keep going, which is great. Um, our core team is gonna continue to implement strategies uh, review what we've done so far, um, adapt as things change, and keep going on implementation. 
We are identifying our next round of projects in March, so that's really exciting. And we're hoping to have a new website up uh, the spring of this year so that you'll be able to learn more um, about what we're doing. And that's everything for me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Julie. Wonderful, yeah, great to hear about uh, the hundreds of acres acquired across PEI for the Natural Area Protected, Pro Pro Protection Act over the past number of years, that's great. Um, also interesting about uh, crumb holes. I, it's, I was, I, I'd never known that that's the name for those trees. You see them all over the place on PEI. Before hearing that, I just thought crumb holes were the cracks between the, the couch cushions. But now we know. There we go. I had to say it. You're stealing the line. <laughs> All right, let's uh, bring up the uh, next presenter, uh, Garrett Momberkett from Parks Canada. Here we go. Thank you so much, Todd. I'm ashamed I didn't come up with that one. I will be stealing it. Excellent. Well, thank you all for uh, being here and virtually. Uh, it's an honor. Thank you, uh, Janelle, for the invitation to join today. Uh, my name is Garrett Mumberkett. I'm a climate change specialist with Prince Edward Island National Park, uh, located on the north shore of Aboguit, Prince Edward Island, in the unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kma'ki. Uh, today, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the work that we're doing in Prince Edward Island National Park that stretches beyond our boundaries to support landscape scale climate resilience. So if you aren't familiar, Prince Edward Island National Park is a thin strip segmented along the north shore of Prince Edward Island. Uh, it represents the Maritime Plain Natural Region that's established in 1937. Prior to park establishment, much of it was active agricultural land, and so still the, the, to the soil is, is tilled and rapidly erodes. Uh, it, it's one of the more vulnerable or exposed uh, national parks across the country to the effects of climate change. Uh, had I seen Gary's presentation before, I would have taken a cue and uh, continued on with beautiful pictures of the, the national park that I'm privileged to work in. Uh, here are several. So within Parks Canada, we do take a, a whole of government approach to the sharing of climate science and climate data. Uh, Parks Canada collaborates with the Canadian Center for Climate Services for up-to-date projections for climate science and climate information. All of this information is publicly available and shared online at climatedata.ca, so that's all freely available. Um, when it comes, though, to the application of that information and what it means for conservation work, we call this field the field of climate smart conservation, or in other words, not just how we what we do differently uh, to adapt to or identify solutions to climate change, but how we view all of the conservation work we do in this new lens of, of climate change uh, and in what way we're orienting our work in light of uh, what likely scenarios are, are, are at our doorstep. So climate smart conservation refers specifically to the intentional and deliberate consideration of climate change in natural resource management through forward looking goals and strategies linked to key climate impacts and vulnerabilities. Applying climate smart conservation means considering a full range of the options available to us and then selecting them in terms of their suitability in light of what we know about how ecosystems have functioned in the past, but also how we anticipate they will function in the future. So uh, one promising approach for identifying the full range of adaptation strategies, which we've been applying to the conservation work uh, that we undertake is the RAD framework or, or the RAD lens. This RAD framework uh, uh, implores us to consider conservation actions in terms of whether they resist change, whether they manage for a historical condition, uh, whether they accept change, as in allowing some change to naturally occur, uh, or perhaps monitor that change in order to better understand it before making a targeted intervention, 
or actually direct change, actively shaping the trajectory of ecosystem processes, function, structure, or composition towards preferred new conditions. So for instance, choosing to plant more temperate hardwood species, uh, as opposed to a boreal species such as balsam fir or black spruce, which may be native, but may not fare as well uh, under future climatic conditions. Uh, Julie Lynn, thank you so much for introducing conservation standards so that I don't have to have a diagram up here. Uh, but when we do think about uh, conservation standards and bringing folks together to map out how climate change is relevant to our conservation work, we consider climate change in two key ways. One is that climate change does produce altogether new direct threats, foreign to us in the past, ones that we had not conceived of, which we're now faced with. Uh, these we frame up as direct threats in the conservation standards link up. Uh, for those already initiated. Uh, we also consider how climate change can exacerbate conventional non-climate related threats. So for instance, uh, beach visitation can be reasonably driven by a beautiful day, uh, beautiful warm conditions. And so if we're expecting higher temperatures on average or longer stretches of drier periods, we might expect to see more visitors uh, attracted to these places that we're trying to protect. And thus we might see more of an issue around human wildlife coexistence. So it's important to be able to anticipate that and proactively plan for what that visitation might look like and what we might do differently. So uh, within our conservation standards uh, planning and the work we've been involved in, we have applied the RAD framework to all of the strategies that we identify. So when we come up with a solution, we consider does that solution resist change? Does it manage in reference to a historic condition? Uh, is it an accept strategy? So is it something that helps us monitor and better understand the change that's occurring? Or instead, is it a targeted active management intervention to, to help build climate resilience into the future? So now for a few of a, a quick sampling of some of the initiatives that we're currently undertaking. Uh, one is some, a, a partnership with the UPEI Canadian Centre for Climate Change and Adaptation. So, so some of you may be familiar with the new building out in uh, St. Peter's Bay, beautiful building up on the hill. Um, in Prince Edward Island National Park, we have a partnership with the Canadian Centre to advance shared climate change priorities. And this includes several active research permits, which are led by folks such as Dr. Xander Wang and Dr. Adam Fennick. Um, we also in Prince Edward Island National Park contribute towards the landscape uh, scale network of weather stations or climate stations across Prince Edward Island, which you'll find at weather.peiclimate.ca. In Prince Edward Island National Park, we have added four stations live contributing real-time data, which you can access uh, in Cavendish, North Rustico, Stanhope, and Greenwich. So here we're trying to fill the gap that otherwise we didn't have that data on the landscape. We hadn't had those weather stations previously. I'm proud to share some work of some colleagues of mine in the audience today, uh, restoring Acadian forests in Prince Edward Island National Park. So work has been underway for decades to restore the region's characteristic Acadian forest composition, a mix of the, the temperate uh, hardwood species such as red oak, uh, and also the softwood forest trees such as uh, balsam fir or black spruce. So two of the best practices when we think about climate smart conservation, which we've applied, are considering a, a variety of criteria when selecting strategies, and also accepting uncertainty and embracing adaptive management, learning as we go and applying those learnings to do conservation better. Uh, so for instance, we've collaborated with the University of New Brunswick and Natural Resources Canada and the Technical University of Munich to develop a new forest change model, which will project future forest composition under different climate scenarios and under different management actions. So we can consider adding a seed source and what that will look like over time uh, and what we might do differently, basically to get the best bang for our buck and ensure that the, the trees we plant today provide the seed sources that are necessary to sustain a healthy forest into the future. Uh, we also, in September 2021, launched the COSTI Initiative, a new citizen science initiative, which uh, uses visitors' smartphones to capture coastal change dynamics. Essentially, uh, you visit a coasty station in Prince Edward Island National Park or elsewhere in a national park, uh, place your cell phone in, take a photo, submit it online to coastycanada.ca, where it's received by researchers at the University of Windsor who can then process that data. And it's kind of cool because each coasty stand has been surveyed so that um, the photo that's taken from your field of view 
can be rectified or, or processed to look instead as if it was taken from space or from straight down. So then we're able to uh, draw a line of, of vector points and then track uh, whether the coastline is receding or accreting, also looking at dune vegetation recovery and nearshore ice presence and absence. So um, in PEI National Park from 2000 to 2010, the average rate of shoreline erosion in the till substrate was 88 centimeters a year. From 2010 to 2020, that number went from 88 centimeters to 118 centimeters. The problem was we only had one data point every 10 years, but a growing share of the, the change that we're seeing occurs as a, as a result of uh, weather events that occur over minutes or hours. So it's really critical that we can parse that out and better understand how these systems are recovering following uh, these, these events that are driving uh, the lion's share of change. And finally, with my last minute, I'll share that uh, as part of our recent work to complete a multi-species action plan, we've been partnering with local and regional partners to find synergies across pro projects and identify opportunities for collaborative efforts. Uh, this involves work with the community nominated priority place mentioned, uh, collaboration from the get-go, applying a two-eyed seeing approach, working together in collaboration with First Nation partners in Abiquit and Lennox Island First Nation. And, uh, and really taking every opportunity to explore uh, what are all of the ideas at play across the landscape and where could we as Prince Edward Island National Park uh, help to build capacity to advance conservation across the island. Thank you so much, Carrie Lynn. And that draws me to a close. So uh, I know we have a question period, but if anyone has any, uh, any specific questions or would like to reach out, uh, my name is Garrett Mumbriquette. There is my email. It's not an easy one to remember, so you might want to write it down, but uh, I'll hand it over to Todd. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Garrett. Wow. Such interesting content there. Um, yeah, I, I love hearing about the hard work to restore the Acadian forests uh, in, in the National Park. And uh, I had no idea about the coasty stations either until now. I'm going to take advantage of this. Yeah, it's fantastic. And interesting enough, too, um, to this point in the evening, no one, I don't think there's any been, been any like direct mention of Fiona to this point, oddly enough. Has anyone, I don't think any, anyone's really mentioned it. It's all, it's on everyone's minds. It's just, she's like the big elephant in the room in a way. But uh, when you were talking about uh, the, the threats, the direct threats, obviously, Fiona would be a key direct threat in the forthcoming storms whenever they are to happen. But yeah, thank you again for that, Garrett. Um, and we just have one more presenter for the night, uh, Tina Northrup uh, from East Coast Environmental Law. And she's going to be presenting virtually. She's our, our only virtual presenter of the night. That's not Tina right now. Um, <laughs> none of those are. Oh, there she is. Hi, Tina. Great to see you. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Great, great. And I'll just start by saying thanks so much to Island Nature Trust for inviting me to, to join you tonight and for accommodating um, me attending virtually. I really appreciate the, the accommodation. I'm based in, in, uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and so it would have been um, a little bit of a trip in, although it would have been lovely to, to be there and see some, some old friends and familiar faces and, and meet some, some new folks as well. Uh, so my presentation tonight is on legal protections for species at risk in Prince Edward Island and... Um, and it's going to be a you know a bit of a, a kind of like high level fast paced overview uh, given the time that we have, but um, certainly happy to to address things more questions or to follow up afterwards with folks wanting to know more. And I will say uh, as I jump in that you know the focus on species at risk is um, is coming about for a couple of reasons. I mean, obviously when we talk about biodiversity and when we talk about the the scale and the complexity of what an international instrument like the Convention on Biological Diversity is, is designed to protect, it can be difficult to think about the ways in which legal instruments, uh, things like statutes or regulations can, um, can properly get at the, the full complexity of, of, um, 
of, of biological diversity in, in all its forms and the, the way in which species interact and, uh, and exist not only as individuals, but as part of, of complex ecosystems. And so um, when we think about the ways in which Canada has been moving domestically to, to implement the Convention on Biological Diversity and, and try to meet its commitments and, and its goals underneath it, I mean, there are a number of ways that uh, the government of Canada and governments, provinces and territories and, and Indigenous governments and other bodies um, throughout the country tend to get at that. One is through sort of protected places programs of various kinds. Uh, there are also you know, ecosystem protection initiatives like we've been hearing about tonight and nature conservation uh, initiatives. But then legal protection for species at risk is another major piece of that puzzle. So thinking about individual species, but then also trying to sort of think about them in the context of, of their broader ecosystem needs. But the focus on species at risk and those protections for individual species really comes about in large part because we're trying to identify and think about individual species that are really at, on the brink. They're, they're in peril in a way that is noticeable and requires um, potentially more immediate and, uh, and targeted action than thinking, um, than thinking about uh, you know, biodiversity recovery as a whole and on the grander scale that we sometimes think about when we talk about the higher level targets. So just a little bit of context for the shape of my presentation tonight and, and why it is that I'm going to be talking about what it is that I'll be talking about. My organization, East Coast Environmental Law, is a public interest environmental law charity. And we do a lot of public legal education, uh, a lot of law reform advocacy, and, and also some, um, some monitoring and reporting on government action uh, on various environmental law issues. And one of the things we've been doing over the past number of years is assessing the extent to which governments in Atlantic Canada, provincial governments in particular, are complying with legal obligations that they have set out for themselves under provincial species at risk legislation. And so we've been slowly developing a series of reports. And the most recent addition to that series is a report that we published last winter that looked at the state of Prince Edward Island's legal framework to protect species at risk. And as you'll see from this list, I mean, most of our reports uh, have begun with the phrase protected on paper only, which was an indication of the reality that uh, in what we were seeing in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick was that species at risk laws uh, under various names had been established, but then, uh, and species had been designated and so um, protected on paper, but then governments weren't actually fulfilling their commitments to engage in recovery and management planning, uh, to identify critical habitat um, under various names, whatever they might be, and to move forward in protecting habitat areas. What we saw in Prince Edward Island when we looked at it was a little bit different in that in Prince Edward Island, we actually couldn't find any evidence that the specific laws that have been established in Prince Edward Island to protect species at risk uh, were being used. So, so that was a bit of a convoluted sentence to boil it down. Couldn't find any evidence that, that those specific laws protect species at risk were actually being employed in any way. So we have laws set out in Prince Edward Island's Wildlife Conservation Act, which is broader than addressing species at risk, uh, but does include the provinces of species at risk specific laws. And those laws are designed theoretically to enable the provincial government to identify and designate endangered, threatened, uh, and uh, endangered and threatened species and species of special concern and take various actions to, to protect them. But no species have been designated under the act. Uh, and so therefore none of the, the things that would follow from designation like automatic protections or, um, or further um, further protections that might be added after that uh, can really be put in place. I mean, designation is really the starting point. We want a list of species to which the acts protections would apply and we don't actually see that. Um, so a pretty striking um, gap. Uh, and this is ultimately you know, one of the things that our report addresses. And in addition to calling on the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action to do things that the act empowers him to do, not least of which is, um, is sort of move and make recommendations to the, the provincial executive to, to designate species that require protection, uh, but also you know, to, use, um, to use other powers to, to go forward and protect species once designation has happened. 
But on top of that, we also call for all government parties to work together to create stronger species at risk legislation on the island because we were, um, you know, really the Wildlife Conservation Act um, is kind of noticeably slimmer than species at risk legislation that we see elsewhere in Atlantic Canada and at the federal level and in other jurisdictions throughout Canada. So just very quickly, I mean, this the next few slides just give you a sense of the, the key provisions that address species at risk uh, in, in Prince Edward Island. We've really got provisions that identify, um, you know, what can enable the minister to sort of go to the governor and council or the lieutenant governor and council rather and, you know, and say these species should be designated. So specific characteristics for endangered and threatened species and species of special concern. Uh, we then have uh, prohibitions, like offenses that would kick in automatically if species were designated, uh, having to do with the killing or other interference with individuals, species, possession, uh, and then also um, destruction, disturbance or interference with uh, species habitats. And then there's some other powers that exist under the Act, pretty important uh, discretionary powers, establishing an advisory committee, uh, acquiring land, making agreements with landowners and conservation groups, et cetera, et cetera. But noticeably, I mean, these really are tied um, in, uh, many of them are tied to, to um, that first step of having species designated. So there are a number of things that we would expect to see in strong species at risk legislation that at this time don't really exist in, um, in Prince Edward Island species at risk uh, legislation, the provisions in the Wildlife Conservation Act. And I can circle back to this um, just given time constraints. So just a, a couple of, of notes on, on developments that followed our report. And, you know, in, in framing this up, I mean, uh, you know, in terms of like temporal, uh, you know, consequential kind of one thing followed after another, they did follow our report. But I don't want to give the impression that our report was uh, was a standalone catalyst here. I mean, the what we were writing about in our report was in many ways echoing um, and amplifying concerns that we were hearing from community groups that we work with on the island. And uh, there have been a number of organizations on the island that have obviously been doing um, you know, incredible advocacy and work on species at risk conservation and protection for, for years and years, Island Nature Trust, among them Nature PEI and, and many others. And so I don't want to give the impression that uh, that we're taking credit here, but it did. Um, the report did generate some discussion in legislative assembly in the uh, the late winter and the spring of 2022, and ultimately there were indications that uh, the government would work on legislative amendments of some kind to um, to bring in stronger legal protections for species at risk. In June, there were presentations, one by myself, uh, and then later on presentations by the deputy minister of environment, um, energy, and uh, and climate action uh, having to do with the existing state of legal protections for species at risk and ideas about potentially uh, moving forward with legislative amendments. And then uh, just in November, there were formal recommendations made by the chair of the standing committee um, to the rest of government about uh, moving forward on some of these issues. So immediate creation of an advisory committee uh, is an important one. Um, also recommendations to take an ecosystem braced approach to conservation ensuring that the department is adequately resourced to carry out this work, which is really important from a practical perspective, um, and, uh, and taking some other steps um, that could involve uh, legislative amendments. So I'll leave it there for now, but as I say, happy to, um, to circle back to any of this in, in questions or to follow up afterwards. Thanks very much. Wow, that's some very impactful points to be bringing to the table tonight. Uh, thank you so much for that, Tina. Um, really, really striking, I, I must say, to echo your same word that you used. Uh, it is striking that, uh, well, to see protected on paper only for those years for Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, on paper only sounds bad enough and then to see for PEI couldn't find any evidence that PEI is taking any action uh, to protect endangered species, threatened species and species of concern. We do not have strong species at risk, risk legislation on PEI. Wow. Um, I think we're going to have some, some good questions coming 
fourth uh, in this next round for you, that's for sure. Um, and, and it is time now to uh, actually open it up to questions. Uh, we're, we're coming around near the end of the night, but uh, we will have about a 20 minute question time period. So I'm gonna invite uh, the, the speakers up to sit at the table here, um, Garrett and Aleda and uh, Julie Lynn. And then I guess we still will have Tina chiming in virtually. You can, you can still ask a question to Tina, right? Thumbs I'm still up. here. I don't know if you can still hear me, but I'm still here. Yeah, is it possible to have Tina up on the screen again? She's back. <laughs> All right. So uh, we can open up the floor once again here. And uh, I, I do want to remind people, um, actually, I'm going to adjust that. I can adjust the microphone for people if they if that is if the height is wrong. But uh, yeah, please. Come on up and introduce yourselves and just try to keep, because in the interest of time, just keep the, the questions nice and succinct. Hi, I'm Will Howard. Um, since we haven't talked about Fiona yet, I thought maybe we could chat a bit about it. Um, and I'm curious what you see as the, you know, we've talked a lot about the bad things that came out of Fiona, but I'd be curious to hear about the opportunities that you see from it. I think the walking around and the woodlots that I've done, it's pretty striking the difference between uh, the resilience between monocultures and more mixed forests. So, yeah, just curious about some of the opportunities you see coming out of that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, ha happy to start. Um, in Prince Edward Island National Park, over white overnight on uh, when was Dorian. Uh, September 2019. I had just started in, in Prince Edward Island a few months earlier, having moved up from Cape Breton. Um, we, as I mentioned, the park was established in 1937. Much of the land had previously been active agricultural land. And on active agricultural land, when the land is abandoned, one of the early colonizer species that shows up is white spruce. So we had an even age stand of white spruce uh, at 60 to 80 years old at about the age of collapse, which was ready to go. So Dorian for us was the canary in the coal mine uh, in Cavendish campground. And Fiona was entirely anticipated. So in terms of our forest, uh, it was actually a, a positive step in terms of facilitating that transition towards the Acadian composition that we know to be representative and healthy and more climate resilient uh, and more capable of supporting biodiversity uh, across the park. So fortunately, we had underplanted already in uh, a lot of the park. So now there's light, let there be light. Uh, so uh, now we have the opportunity to watch as the forest uh, renews. And as we um, uh, wait, uh, we'll start to see, as, as we wait, we'll start to see the signs of, of life uh, before us uh, and a greater, a greater diversity of species, of native species, which were there previously, which is a good sign. Uh, in terms of our coastline though, uh, a lot of the sand that had been taken from the dunes now sits just offshore. Uh, dunes form where the conditions, where the geomorphology has, or dunes will form where the conditions have historically allowed them to form. And because the conditions have historically allowed them to form along the North Shore of Prince Edward Island, we fully expect them to recover. What's key now is that we give them space and allow them to recover. So we can all do our part by staying off the dunes, uh, by giving space to Mother Nature in this vulnerable time. and. Uh, yeah, uh, staying engaged in, in the story of uh, resilience and renewal, uh, which is bound to, to follow in the next few years. So it's a pretty exciting time uh, to be an ecologist and hopefully to be a, an islander who can visit and see these places as they transform. I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, from an FLPP perspective, Forest and Landscape Priority Place, um, I think Fiona brought climate change to the top of everyone's mind. And a lot of our member groups, um, you know, have people asking, okay, so what can I do about my woodlot? My wood lot? Um, it's destroyed. Um, and they just want to go in and clean it up. And, and together as a group, we're kind of coming together to promote some 
some different messaging, um, kind of along the lines of what Garrett's saying. Um, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to come back and build better. Um, and also, we don't need to go in and clean things up. Um, forests are just fine, and they will recover. And sometimes, um, having more, um, you know, coarse woody debris on the ground is better for soil moisture and some of those um, some species at risk. Um, so. Yeah, we're just trying to promote um, a more holistic message um, and use it as an opportunity to talk about forests and how we can restore them. And that's kind of what we're doing right now. Thank you. And um, I just think there wasn't enough time in 10 minutes to add Fiona into my presentation. Uh, we Everything that, that Julie Lynn has just mentioned, um, and we're I'm part of that as well. Um, and I'm, I'm actively seeking, um, I've been messaging and, and getting um, reaching out to members of Abigwit First Nation and Lennox Island First Nation um, to say what would you like to do what or has there any ever been historically uh, something like this that has happened and and what has been done and my timing was terrible they have had um, three losses in their community and especially in Abigwit um, two elders recently and a young person um, shortly before that. So I'm just going to let them take their time and, and talk about it. But um, thinking about um, echoing many of the things that have been said, um, I think we need to think about first, do no harm. We don't always need to rush in and fix it. You know, maybe we don't need to fix anything. <laughs> so, um, but I'm, I'm wanting to hear more um, input from our Indigenous um, community members. Thank you, Alida. Um, Tina, did you want to hop in on any of this? No, I think I'll, I'll let that one pass. I think our base covered a lot of things. Great. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that great question. Excellent. Um, anyone else? Any questions coming to mind? Yeah. This time I'll introduce myself. My name is David Cairns. I'm a scientist emeritus with the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and this question is relevant to my work with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you very much, Tina, for pointing out the shortcomings uh, at the provincial level of uh, endangered species protection uh, in this province. I would not want people to go home thinking that everything is fine on the federal side because we do have a clear federal legislation, the Species at Risk Act, which has been in place for uh, 20 odd years. And I'll give you an example which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I spent much of my career working on the biology and conservation of the American eel. In 2006, uh, the American eel uh, was recommended for listing on the Species at Risk Act by CSIBIC, which is a scientific body that makes those recommendations. It is now 17 years later. The Government of Canada has not yet made a decision as to whether or not the American eel will be listed under SARA. 17 years of no decision is a long time. Okay. Would anyone like to comment uh, on that? I mean, I'm certainly happy to to follow up and, and say thanks for the comment. And and certainly, yes, I think uh, I think it's an important point. I mean, pointing out um, absence of strong species at risk laws does not, in and of itself, mean that uh, strong laws on paper are going to to solve the problem. There's obviously a lot that needs to follow in terms of strong implementation, which is which is certainly a major part of our focus as an organization and, and a lot of the advocacy that we do. So so I think that's that's a good point. And I would also just want to follow up quickly too on um, on something that might not have been entirely clear, and I would just want to make sure that it was clear from my presentation. I mean, our report in my presentation isn't suggesting that there are absolutely zero legal protections for species at risk on the island. There are protections for individual species that exist in um, in other slightly different sort of legal spheres and, and regimes. And even under the Wildlife Conservation Act, there are some protections that get assigned to species that are designated um, in, a, in a different space, not because they have been formally assessed and identified as endangered, threatened, or 
uh, endangered or threatened species or species of special concern, but um, out of sort of a, a kind of um, almost like a kind of hunting regulations a regime that looks a little bit more like that, although it's not precisely that. And similarly, there are federal laws like the Species at Risk Act that will apply in certain uh, spheres within the province and, and the Federal Migratory Birds Convention Act will also apply in certain contexts. But those laws, even when you think about the, the kind of patchwork quilt of protections that they create in and of themselves, I would say do not compensate for having strong provincial legislation at home. So just a clarification there that um, um, that I think might be necessary. And just because Todd, your comments following my presentation sort of suggested that there were no legal protections for species at risk. And I just want to be clear that's, that's not exactly what we're saying. Yes, thank you for clarifying that, Tina. Yeah. John Rowe. <clears throat> John Rowe, I've been involved with uh, a few things over the years, but I uh, want to thank Tina for clarifying that because we're well aware that there are lots of laws on the books that are totally ignored by governments past and present. Uh, we do live in a democracy. We're very fortunate we don't live in the United States because they only have two parties there. And Prince Edward Island, some of us will have an opportunity to uh, make decisions possibly this year. I think we have at the moment at least five parties on Prince Edward Island, and that uh, leaves us a choice. If we're all totally satisfied with the healthcare system and PEI and the way <clears throat> the government's running it, then uh, we have an opportunity to uh, congratulate them on that when we have uh, the writ dropped. Uh, if we're totally, uh, uh, you know, congratulating them on their conservation efforts, et cetera, et cetera, then we can also do the same thing. We can re-elect them or choose other opportunities. One of the things I'm concerned about, though, and I have been involved with woodlots for quite a number of years, and I'm very fortunate to own a few sticks that are now lying prone on the ground. Uh, I think it was 80% was flattened by, according to my uh, uh, co-workers there in the uh, forestry department there with Julie, but nevertheless, I, I think that the biggest concern, as we are aware, well aware, is that we've had some very hot, dry summers. And if we don't do something, and we don't do something quickly, uh, then we could be in for a disaster. I know that my property is right around Trackety Bay, and it's like a funnel. And when the storm came in, the storm surge went up a thousand feet on my property, deposited everything that was in the bay on the property, filled in my Ducks Unlimited pond, I think. I haven't walked on it yet to find out. But nevertheless, we, we really have to be cognizant of the fire concern that we would have, because I know that if there was a spark lit at that particular side, it would simply go from there to Grand Trackety Harbor. But I do have one question for uh, young man from the National Park. How long do you think it will take the, uh, we used to call it black bush when I was growing up in Trackety. There was an extended uh, sand dune that went from Dalvey over to the Blooming Point Pond. It was about a half a mile wide or more, and it was totally covered with trees. Now there's a gap there, and I'm told that it keeps getting wider, and it certainly was widened during, the, during Fiona. How long, how many years do you think it will take for that particular sand dune to fill in those gaps now, or will Trackety Bay be full of sand before that happens? Thanks. It's a great question. Thank you very much for it. Uh, I'm not a geomorphologist, so I'm reluctant to provide, and I'm not able to provide like a educated guess with great certainty. Um, we have in Prince Edward Island National Park completed nearshore bathymetric surveys to look at where sand tends to sit and where it's likely to begin uh, recovering. We have not yet conducted a bathymetric survey post Fiona, so we do expect that there's a lot of sand sitting offshore along that section uh, ready to begin accreting, uh, especially as over the summer months and into the fall. Um, in the Dow Bay sector of the park, as you might have seen on the front page of the Guardian today, uh, we, we experienced a, about six meters of erosion. So a lot of the dune was, was sheared off, uh, exposing the roadbed. Um, to your question though, unfortunately, 
nearshore sediment modeling continues to elude us. Uh, and it's because it's only been in recent years that we've been able to conduct nearshore bathymetric surveys using LIDAR and connect that to the terrestrial system. Our models just are not um, equipped to be able to predict with great, great certainty about a, a time window for recovery for a specific location. I'm sorry that that's unsatisfying. It's also deeply unsatisfying for me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that question. And uh, yes, are we about wrapping up? How many, about five minutes, yeah. So let's, Hi. yeah. Let's uh, I'm Kristen Mead. I just had a question about land covenants, um, specifically as they relate to planting trees or shrubberies. There's a lot of them on PEI, and I'm just wondering if there's any legal way around them or any way we can advocate for getting rid of them altogether. Um, Great question on land covenants. Uh, anyone would like to speak to that? Tina included or actually, yeah. I'm not sure what you mean by land covenants, like um, protected areas? No, so like a lot of um, farmland when it gets broken up and sold into lots to buy a home, they, the, the, farmer or whoever owns the land will put a covenant on to say that you can't plant trees so that it blocks the view from the people behind you. And sometimes you can, for example, like we have negotiated planting two trees over five feet, but we're not allowed to plant hedges. And it's very common, especially in like newer developments and... I don't, I've never encountered that. So I really don't know how to answer that question. I don't know if anyone else does, Lana. <laughs> yeah, it's like we know what we're getting into when we buy there, but when you go around PEI, yeah, you don't see trees anywhere. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why is because of these covenants. So I'll do that. Thank you. Tina, did you have anything just as a lawyer? Tina, did you have anything you'd like to weigh in on with that? I mean, to be honest, I'm having trouble hearing some of the conversation back and forth. And so, I mean, I've, I've got a general sense of the question was about right. covenanting, like, and in order to conserve private land, but I'm not sure that I've been able to hear back and forth well enough to weigh in conscientiously. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay right now? I can, yeah. So the question is on land covenants and specifically about uh, trees that are, are not uh, permissible to plant in certain areas. And it was brought to the table that, that that is more of a municipal issue than provincial. But I think what you're getting at is you would love to see maybe eventually a, a provincial, uh, just a provincial addressing of this issue, perhaps. Tina, any? Um, yeah. Subdivisions, right. Yeah. Oh, as part of a subdivision process. I think that's a really interesting question. I would want to, I would want to have a, like, take a minute to kind of get myself better informed before weighing in on that. But I would right. say that, like, if that's a pressing question that the member of the audience had, they'd really like to see answered, like, please feel free to, to reach out, um, I mean, our organization has a, an environmental law inquiry service. It's easily accessible on our website, and it's mainly to answer like environmental law questions. And we've had some like land uh, covenanting questions in the past, and so certainly something I'd be happy to look into, just on the level of providing a bit of information that might help somebody navigate the the area of the law as it exists. Thank you. Excellent. With that, I think that probably. Uh, We'll conclude our evening as, as far as the questions go. And um, could you all give a round of applause for our, our four fantastic presenters from the second half. And again, big thanks to our four presenters from, from the first half as well. Round of applause for them. Um, I am, I'm, I'm going to, I was asked to finish off uh, the night with with a song. So I am going to do that here right now. Um, if you want, you could go to your seats. You don't have to stay sitting up here. <laughs> um, 
And just before I do that, I, I did want to say that um, I think all of us tonight have been reminded about the importance of action at a grassroots level, the importance of the individual taking action. And once again, that's what, what our tree is about out there. If you haven't put on on your leaf you, what you're going to do with your own individual action to, uh, to help biodiversity and PEI, please do before the night is through. Um, I have enjoyed this evening so, so much. Uh, I don't know how you felt about it, but personally, I would love it if this went on on a weekly basis. I just absolutely love this. This is, it's amazing. And it, honestly, I'm, I am, I'm kind of joking when I say that yet. I'm also half serious, um, it is just of paramount importance to have constant communication about this highly important issue uh, locally, you know, provincially, regionally, um, and, and globally. And uh, it was, this is the key reason why I did the, the book uh, Global Chorus uh, that I created in 2014 was to put together a global roundtable of people talking about very crucial issues uh, about our environmental future and just to try to help promote more and more conversation on, on these key subjects. And I really hope that all of you from what we've been inspired on tonight will go out into your own, your own households, your, you know, your families, your communities and bring forth, um, this 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 knowledge and uh, this inspiration and hopefully we'll keep this tidal wave going and i really do hope that you know it's not going to be a weekly event but if we could make this more of a regular thing i know um it's been an amazing amount of work that the island nature trust has put into this and uh, i'd like could you could we all give another round of applause for int for the great work oh Bravo for this initiative, and uh, I do hope that as well, um, Joanna, you and I were talking about the tree earlier. Uh, there's some ideas, maybe maybe that tree might be displayed in the library downtown. Who knows? We got to ask them first. It could happen. Um, and at, at least I really hope that uh, these ideas will, will be able to be put forth and, and uh, put into action. Um, Cassidy, did you have, did you want to announce the winner of this, this book before I get to this song too? Okay. Thank you. Um, so I just want to thank everybody who had time to come over and talk to us at our booth. Thank you. Um, if you didn't get to ask your question tonight, uh, please reach out to us. So we have a website. Um, and yeah, our game was basically, we had all kinds of seeds. We have uh, had native seeds labeled in jars and we had invasive seeds labeled in jars. And we asked you to guess which seeds uh, you thought were uh, native species. And we did have a correct guess, which we were very uh, excited about by Nancy Next. And she won the Restoring the Acadian Forest book, and which is a great book if you haven't read it. And uh, just a final note uh, before I let our musician play is um, the reason we were kind of do, uh, choosing seeds as a topic is when you go into the woods in order to not spread invasive uh, seeds, we saw all different kinds of sizes of seeds there. Um, they can get in your boots and you can accidentally introduce them to your favorite trails. Um, so if you have like an old toothbrush or if you can get yourself a nice boot brush online or something, um, that's just a great thing to take with you next time. All right, thank you so much, Cassidy, and congratulations to our winner. Hooray. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, this song that I prepared for tonight, I've never performed this before. Um, I wanted to prepare it specifically for the evening, and it involves uh, a quotation from, I only heard this quote for some reason, uh, a month ago on CBC Radio, it was on ideas, um, and this this quote is from uh, a scientist named Gus Speth, and the quote is going to repeat 
several times, basically like a meditation, as I play some music. Now, um, it's important that I note that um, he says in the quote, uh, we scientists, he's, he's, it's about cultural and spiritual trans transformation, which is at the heart of what we need as a globe right now in 23, 2023 and, and moving onward. Um, it's been an incredible amount of environmental work that has been done in recent decades, but this scientist says that what we really need right now is a cultural and spiritual transformation. And he does say, we scientists don't know how to do that, but I really want to remind everyone that, uh, well, I think we all know how to do that. And, um, this is all part of it. What, what has gone on tonight? This is basically environmental talk therapy in a way. And we need to continue that, that talk therapy, um, all over the globe. And uh, I really believe in us as humanity. I know it's hard to keep that hope up, but uh, it, it's, yeah, I, I fully believe in us. And um, I just, yeah, hope that that, uh, that hope will spread across the world. And um, yeah, thank you all for, for uh, raising the hope bar tonight with this. So, I'm going to start start this off. I also have to tell you I have a I'm going to try to play two instruments at once here because I have a foot keyboard. So I'm going to start it off with that. Yeah, it's it's like a it basically plays like bass notes. What an organist might have, but it's in a, a compact thing. So I'm going to play that with my feet to start with and start this quote and then I'm going to play some saxophone and it, it this is a familiar song. I'm sure a lot of you will recognize it, but an instrumental version of it. Hopefully you enjoy this. Thank you. I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. I used to think that top environmental problems or biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought 
that 30 years of good science could address these problems. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, spiritual transformation. To deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. Thank you all so much. What an amazing evening. Big thanks again to the Island Nature Trust and all of our wonderful presenters. Thank you all. Take care. And a big thanks to Todd. What a great way to end the evening. Thank you.